If you're anything like me and terminally on YouTube, you may have, over the past few months, gotten this very strange movie trailer ad if you clicked on one of my videos, a left-leaning YouTuber's videos, or even larger trans-focused channels like One Topic at a Time or Trixie Mattel. For the first five seconds of the ad, the same amount of time, ironically, that a YouTube audience would watch before hitting the skip ad button to spend more productive time watching me being a weirdo, the trailer appears to be an overacted, yet transgender supportive docudrama. Do you think you'd be happier as a boy? My mom would never allow it. That's abuse. And a trans supportive ad like that playing on my channel would make sense given my, well, my everything. Have you seen me? I'm like one of the transiest transes to ever trans. Trans. But let's suppose those five or six seconds intrigued you because you've rarely seen a docudrama be so supportive of transgender people. In that case, if you continue to watch, the ad soon takes a strange turn as it begins to talk about how parents have become enemy number one in a fight against governments, corporations, teachers, and politicians who are trying to push gender ideology on kids, causing irreversible damage to poor children, especially young girls. When did parents become enemy number one? This is all coming from the top, the major corporations, governments, politicians. You have a pipeline. It's also in the education system. So today we're going to talk a bit about genders. Genders. With the trailer ending on a few shots of not only what is one of the worst wigs in film history, which must be in and of itself some kind of child endangerment, but also with the trailer asking, why are they all doing this? Like, this is the most important question. Why are they all doing this? A vague they left in the air meant to get you to ask, who are they? And why are they trying to trans my children into wearing bad wigs? This trailer was for the feature film Gender Transformations – The Untold Realities, a docudrama made by Epic Times, a far-right newspaper that has gained more and more prominence in right-wing spaces in recent years after it promoted QAnon and anti-vaccine misinformation. Gender Transformations was being distributed on Epic TV, Epic Times' streaming service platform that features other Epic original films like The Unseen Crisis, Vaccine Stories You Were Never Told, or Gotaways, The Hidden Border Crisis, or the real story of January 6th. All films trying to sell themselves as the true story that the mainstream doesn't want you to hear. Also, it has a film called The Stray Story, A Documentary, which, um, I'm not sure what's going on with that one. It looks adorable though, but I, I am scared to watch. Okay. On its face, Gender Transformations as a film fits within the rest of this kind of content. A film consolidating the ongoing culture war narratives against transgender people of the LGBTQ groomer agenda, scaremongering you to get you to buy their merch, only differentiating itself by featuring a fictionalized dramatization of an actual trans person's supposed life. Hence the terrible wigs. No trans person would be caught dead with a wig like that. Let let's just be honest. And that's really what I thought this film was. However, as I began to research the film, because it kept appearing on ads on my channel, what I assumed would have been a watered-down version of Matt Walsh's and The Daily Wire's similar anti-trans film What is a Woman turned into something much more insidious on its own terms. Unlike Walsh's more direct, personality-driven, anti-trans-hating film, Gender Transformations provides a very different entry point and appeal to its target audience. If you actually watch Gender Transformations, it not only signals all the regular anti-trans talking points, And this chemical was trying to force her little bones to change, you know, to her body. But also begins to slowly build a narrative of dog whistles to much larger narratives. Dog whistles that, if you know to listen to them, play so loudly that they might as well be a Broadway musical number. And kids are sort of a test subject because you may have very large organizations but there's a small group of people who are controlling these organizations and they tend to be political. If you look not too far beneath the surface of gender transformations, there lies a world of international cults, a decades-old propaganda campaign, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, a Karl Marx tsunami stopped by a supposed messiah, and of course... She actually claims that she was impregnated by aliens. Yes, aliens. Sadly, not the fun Star Trek-style aliens with weird forehead ridges. So for today, I want to take a look at the film Gender Transformations, and more specifically, discuss its anti-trans narratives, debunk its claims, and more importantly, 
showcase to you how it sells its narrative to its audience to lead them into a silo of far-right conspiracy theories and communities. Oh man, that epic TV movie sounds absolutely terrible. Let's turn that off. I hope I didn't break that. I need that remote. But yes, we are about to break down a really terrible right-wing movie from a right-wing streaming service. So before we get to that, I feel like it is my duty to tell you about a streaming service that I know you're going to love and a movie that's going to be on it that I really hope you'll love as well because I'm making it. For those of you who don't know or maybe are new to this channel, I am a huge science fiction nerd, and that is why I am making an upcoming science fiction film called Identities. It is a queer horror cyberpunk film that I like to describe as The Matrix meets Severance. And it's gonna star some amazing folks like John Delancey, Q from Star Trek The Next Generation, as well as Abigail Thorne from Philosophy Tube, Maggie Mae Fish from her own eponymous channel, as well as Jessica Nicole from Fringe, and so many other fantastic queer and trans and other LGBTQ folks, both in front of and behind the camera. This movie is honestly a dream come true for me to make. I think it's turning out to be something really special because we are deep, deep into post-production on it now. My life is looking at visual effects. I am kind of at this point where I'm so excited and ecstatic to finally get it out to all of you within the next few months. But I hear you asking, what if I wanna watch said movie? Where can I find it? Well, I have just the streaming service for you. I say in my saleswoman voice, because it is going to be streaming on Nebula, the streaming service made by several of my fellow YouTuber friends who came together to try and make a platform where we don't have to worry about the algorithm and we can get to be able to fund cool stuff like Identities, as well as other YouTubers projects like Abigail Thorne's upcoming horror comedy movie, Dracula's Ex-Girlfriend, as well as Maggie Mae Fish's fantastic film analysis series, Unrated, and so much more original content. Nebula has some of your and my favorite creators like Foreign Man to Foreign Land, FD Signifier, and you know, some other trans YouTuber who likes to talk about gender a whole bunch or whatnot. You, you may like her stuff, you know. And honestly, more earnestly, when you sign up for Nebula, that money goes directly to helping funding creators' projects like my own identities. So if any of that sounds appealing or exciting to you and you want to support a much better streaming service than the one we're going to be talking about for the rest of this video, please consider signing up for Nebula at the link below. And you'll not only be supporting me, you'll be supporting my movie identities and so many other creators. And before we wrap up here, I'm just going to say this right now. This video that you're watching is going to go to some serious places. It's going to get very kind of dark by the end of this video. And I think it's very important to discuss what we're going to be discussing. But at the end of the video, I'm going to have to like awkwardly transition to remind you about Nebula again. So just, just remember the excitement and fun we're having right now, because it's going to get going to get very serious by the end of this. But uh, I do appreciate you sticking through this video because I think it's going to go over some really important information. I'm going to try and make it fun, but know that there is some more fun and joyous stuff that you can support and help support queer and trans creators making earnest art, not just supporting us talking about anti-trans hate all the time. And that is very meaningful to me. But enough of me talking about my own movie. Let's talk about someone else's terrible movie and get going. Now I gotta go find that remote. I do think it's broken. I think I broke it. Before we get into the nitty gritty of gender transformations itself, or even the epic times, I wanna talk about how the film presents itself to its audience sans any context, so we can understand how the film hooks in a potential viewer who isn't aware of the more extensive apparatus of the epic times or anti-trans narratives that they have encountered when they first see the film. At first glance, the Epic Times seems to be marketing and positioning gender transformations in a similar way to how other right-wing streaming services over the past few years, like The Daily Wire Plus, have set up their documentaries in terms of discussing the transgender agenda. In other words, all marketing themselves as the real story that they don't want you to see, that you can only watch if you subscribe now to our platform. 
Most infamously, Daily Wire host and a man who puts a banjo I guarantee you that he doesn't know how to play in the background of his videos, Matt Walsh, <laughs> Use this same strategy in 2022 with his anti-trans disinformation propaganda film, What is a Woman, which I already did a whole video on. What is a Woman consolidated numerous anti-trans narratives into a single movie. The Daily Wire then released it during LGBTQ Pride Month and heavily advertised the film on social media, including on trans supportive sites and YouTube channels like my own, in order to potentially grab any audience members who came to those spaces to learn more about trans people before before they actually engaged with trans supportive content, as well as generate a culture war backlash from queer audiences so the Daily Wire could generate a cancel culture narrative that us queers were trying to silence poor creepy baby doll maker Matt Walsh, thus proving the they don't want you to see aspect of their marketing campaign. Uh, it's fair to say that, that more people will see it and hear about it than would have if the left had never attempted to shut us down in the first place, Pro probably millions more. And the Epic Times, with their streaming service Epic TV, generally seems to be doing this even more blatantly than the Daily Wire Plus, with many of the films on their platform directly in their titles selling themselves as the untold, hidden, unseen stories. Yet, while the end goal strategy is ultimately the same, the framing and emotions engaged with the film Gender Transformations are entirely different than what we saw with What is a Woman. What is a Woman, and all of Matt Walsh slash The Daily Wire's content, is sold on the bravado of its central figures. You have Ben Shapiro's fast-talking I Know More Than You vibe. You have Michael Knowles's uh, Knowlesiness. The big problem is there aren't enough chicks. And Matt Walsh himself is a provocateur, building on the individualistic strongman-esque energy of being the toughest, most masculine person that is often championed by far-right neo-fascist style organizations like the Proud Boys. Walsh's content is meant to come across as bullying and abrasive, building his brand and cult of personality, which is quite evident even in What is a Woman's trailers. Please, if, if one person could tell me what a woman is. You are not here for women! We ask you to leave! What is that? The film itself is dripping with cynicism, irony, bravado, and intentionally incendiary stunts to garner a quick negative emotional reaction. Put a woman in this and I'll put a mask on. Nothing Walsh does in his content is ever entirely sincere. It's engaging his audience's sports fan-like energy of seeing their guy own the libs to be the winner, rather than a much more interesting, curious, earnest exploration of the concept of womanhood that his documentary purports to be. It's irony-pilled in a way that only a petty fascist can sell you. Gender transformations, in contrast, though, makes an entirely different emotional appeal, trying to give itself a sense of heartfelt concern and authority. The first point of engagement with a potential viewer is the film's marketing trailer, which plays an overly melancholic song made for middle school Jessie and her depressive alt-right indie phase with lyrics like, It's so quiet here, and I feel so cold. This house no longer feels like home. You can hear me cry, sing my dreams all die. That plays underneath sound bites that vaguely hint at the dangers of transgender ideology. When did parents become enemy number one? This is all coming from the top, the major corporations. Basically gathered vulnerable children and taught them that it was us against them. We never talk about how much harm is being caused. Like This is the most important question. Why are they all doing this? The trailer then directs you to the film's landing page on Epic TV's website, which highlights the film's accolades and features each of its interviewees as if they exude expertise. We'll get to the actual credentials of all these folks a little bit later on, but the important part here in the marketing is that they appear authoritative. My favorite part of the website, though, is the reviews, which are all glowing, as you'd expect. But if you look closely, all the reviews are from people who appear themselves in the documentary. That's how you know it's good. Thus, we can see that Gender Transformations is trying to lend itself a sense of authorial credibility in the absence of having a central individual figure to sell itself off of like Walsh, who himself often actively shows disdain for science and institutional intellectualism more in keeping with far-right thought. We have people running around with multiple degrees who never needed one. Gender Transformations is actually targeting itself at a more capital L liberal audience who have more built-in trust in institutions and expertise. 
And this feeling extends to the film itself, as it's a docudrama that cuts between traditional talking head interviews with experts and a fictionalized dramatization of the story of Abigail Martinez, the mother of a trans man, Andrew Martinez, who came out as trans while in middle school in the state of California. The docudrama follows Abigail's accounting of events, not her child Andrew that the narrative is mainly centered on. And I make that distinction for reasons that we'll discuss later on. And also, you'll see this as we get into clips from the film, but let me just be very clear up front. This drama is not good. The acting and the writing are atrocious, featuring some of the most on-the-nose dialogue that I've ever heard outside of a Star Wars movie. I mean, why change a perfectly working body, though? Why does it matter what generally pee look or not? I mean, as long as you can, like, pee. <laughs> to be yourself, Leah. Well, are you, like, guys, are you transphobes or what? No, we're not. Sounds like it. We're, I mean, we're just curious. I hope you enjoyed it and are excited about this new semester. So today we're gonna talk a bit about genders. Yeah, that's how every single school day goes. I remember that back in my middle school days, you know. Yes, kids, welcome to your first day of school. Time to talk about gender. We're learning whatever the fuck algebra is, and then right after that it goes into critical race theory. But, while I have been making fun of, and let's face it, will continue to make fun of this film's production value, that low rent feel is actually intentional on the movie's part. In the context of the supposed concern the talking head sections are expressing, the low budget of the movie makes it feel like someone is just trying their best to impart an essential message as best they can. It frames the movie as deeply earnest in its attempt to tell a real story, a story given credence by the film's supposed experts. And on top of all that, let's not forget the wig. Its overacting and bad writing is meant to feel endearing to its intended audience. Supposedly, the choice of dramatizing Abigail's story was made after the director and crew had already begun filming for the movie and had interviewed Abigail and found it so moving that they wished to feature it as a through line for the entirety of the film. And it was, you know, the whole story was so powerful when we, we said we have to focus on that story. So we did um, uh, drama parts of her story. So we, we had actors. So we actually did the, the acting parts in Sweden and we, we, uh, we do reenactments of her whole story to make it come alive, to make people really, you know, feel with her and what's happening with uh, her daughter. Never mind that the film and its narrative were chosen before the director even came on to the project. Yeah, I was uh, approached by the Epoch Times. Uh, yeah. To, uh, they wanted to yeah, expound and look at the, the subject of transgender and yeah, see what's like what's to explore in this area. Speaking of, there is one final essential thing to understand about who this film is intending as its audience. The film's marketing states that it's an award-winning epic original docudrama every parent needs to watch. Making very clear that the people that Epic TV wants to watch this film are parents, not trans people. More subtly, yet specifically, the film seems less interested in parents as a whole than it is in mothers. Not a single father appears throughout the film, not even in Abigail Martinez's story, who is a single mother. Of the 14 interviewees, only four are men. Three are detransitioners, framed as victims of the transgender agenda, and the final is an endocrinologist. The rest are all women, most interviewed in the capacity of mother or teacher or caregiver, despite their lower thirds saying their actual job title. Tell me something about my daughter, because you've never met her. All of this presents a very clear picture of who this film was intended for and who it's attempting to draw into its narrative. Liberal parents supposedly concerned about their child being transgender. That is largely why the film was advertised on trans supportive channels like mine or One Topic at a Time. These ads are meant to head off parents of children who might have sent their family members or guardians a video by a trans person like myself to try to gauge their reaction to it or to try to inform them about how they're feeling as a trans kid or just try to present someone that they care about with educational or positive material about trans people through somewhere like YouTube, which is one of the few places that trans kids can get trans supportive content these days without having to pay money that they probably don't have. The film actively wants to try to deny its audience any access to hearing from an actual trans person, instead wishing their only point of engagement with the trans community to be through their lens and their film alone. 
Because, let's be clear, not a single trans person appears in gender transformations, despite it being supposedly about trans people. And the reason could not be more apparent. Epic Times wants these parents only to hear a narrative about their potential trans children, not from anyone involved with the trans community or actual experts, but from them alone, to limit access to any other avenues of information so they can then be funneled into a single narrative as soon as possible. And then, once they get them subscribed to Epic TV to see this narrative, then they keep them there, and only watching Epic TV's content. These types of tactics dovetail quite heavily with the recruitment tactics of gender-critical feminists, which were explained and investigated heavily by my fellow creator, Kaylee and Conrad, in their own series on gender-critical feminists, whom I interviewed for this video. So I made a fake Facebook account, Carol Marinara, <laughs> a lovely <laughs> Italian woman from Toronto, <laughs> and I entered the groups specifically as a concerned parent. Mm -hmm. And I looked into it, specifically the the parent side because that was the scariest part to me mm -hmm. because gender critical people can rage all they want they can put up adult human female stickers in target or whatever and like yeah it sucks but like they have no real power to do anything but complain and make people's lives less wonderful yeah, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> but when they're parents and there are young people in their care, like that really gets to me. There are some concerned parents who are legitimately concerned about how to best protect their child mm -hmm. and also support their child. Mm -hmm. The problem is once they're in the group, that's not their goal anymore because they are so thoroughly convinced by everyone else in the group that what they're doing is harmful using misinformation pieces like the documentary you're talking about mm -hmm. there's a lot of them um i think like gender a wider lens the podcast is like constantly promoted in there mm -hmm. uh irreversible damage yeah, I was gonna mention um, like the books that yeah. helen joyce's book is yeah. about trans yeah mm -hmm. Uh, specifically, especially Maria Keffler's uh, Desist, Detrans, and Detox, or mm -hmm. I was, <laughs> I, I, don't remember, I don't remember the order, but it's triple D. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the people that enter into the gender critical ones are like, I was in this other group and they were getting mad at me for misgendering or voicing my concerns. They kept saying that um, the things that I was saying were conspiracy theories. So I'm just really glad to be in a group where people tell the truth. They want people to go into every single time a, they hear a trans person speaking about their own experiences with, this is a lie. They are after your children. Unfortunately, most of the people in these gender critical groups did not come in with good intentions. I mean, they probably think they're good intentions, but they are well on the path when they enter. And all of this is not an uncommon type of experience with these types of anti-trans and especially gender critical spaces. Kai Shiver, a detransitioner who identified as a gender critical feminist and worked for those groups who later came back out as a trans man after several years in them, often spoke about how the gender critical groups that they were involved in would filter people into different groups based on their level of acceptance of anti-trans ideologies. People used to contact me about online support groups for female assigned people who were detransitioning, looking for alternative treatments to gender dysphoria and or seeking to reconcile with being female. There were two Facebook groups that I knew of, though I never belonged to either since I don't have a Facebook account. One was supposed to be apolitical and presented itself as trans-friendly, but had radical feminist undertones. The other was explicitly radical feminist slash gender critical. I knew one of the women who administered the groups and I would pass people interested in joining onto her. She would then vet them and decide which groups to admit them to. I believe a lot of people in the first group didn't even know the second one existed. I think back on this now and worry that I directed people looking for support to online communities that ended up radicalizing them. So, now that we understand how gender transformations is trying to lure people into its narrative, let's see how it moves one through its funnel of information with its emotional and pseudoscientific appeals and see where it ultimately is intending to lead them. Again, I'm not kidding. I wish I were. After the opening sequence of the movie acts as a primer, framing the entire film as one leading to a sinister ending... They're just getting pushed through this pipeline of surgery. It's a political agenda being worked out. 
and kids are sort of a test subject. Gender Transformations officially opens up on Abigail Martinez, connecting her story and voiceover visually to the dramatic reenactment that will weave throughout the film. The real world Abigail begins talking about her real life child, a trans man who went by the name of Andrew and used he him pronouns, which we are going to be using throughout this video despite the film itself dead naming and misgendering him throughout. From her perspective, Andrew's mother Abigail states that Andrew grew up a beautiful, happy, girly girl emphasizing inherent femininity. She grew up as a happy little girl, the girly girl in the family. She was the most beautiful and happy little girl. As we hear Abigail's words, we are introduced to a fictionalized version of their family, as the fictional Abigail and her cisgender son enjoy a peaceful violin concert from the fictionalized Andrew, who eventually goes by Evan within the film's narrative. Fictional Evan plays a concert to golden light in a feminine floral dress, the film's language underscoring his femininity. All of this is gender transformations presenting and emphasizing an untainted, peaceful time before the transgender agenda corrupted this poor small family. That second verse flows perfectly now. <laughs> and starting here reveals the film's core intention. While the movie presents itself as a talking head documentary intercut with a reenactment, the reenactment is actually the entire point. The talking heads are here to give a sense of credence to the drama because Experts, who we will see are anything but, explain that what you see actually happens. My name is Kali Fontania, and I am a former public school teacher of 15 years. Hundreds, if not thousands of parents? Our stories are all the same. The film isn't worried about using actual expertise to be persuasive, but is using its aesthetic to instead buttress its emotional argument that is generated by the drama. As we go through, I'm going to highlight and debunk the film's intentional disinformation and what that ultimately reveals about the film's biases. But ultimately, my effort to present information in order to debunk will not disprove the film's narrative to someone who has bought in entirely on its emotional appeal, because the facts here don't matter to the filmmakers and they hope to their audience. The film's emotional pathway is the more critical narrative that we have to track. It's what leads its audience through the supposed facts that the interview segments are trying to present as the truth. So, starting at this idyllic opening, the film plays into the fears and anxieties that its audience was already primed to expect. Many parents who are terrified of their children being trans are looking for information, any information, about something that they don't understand in their child's life. These parents believe that they have paid so much attention to their child that they couldn't have missed something that was internal to them. Their child would have told them or they would have intrinsically known. And so it must be something external that came in instead of an earnest feeling by their child. You know, I went and seek for help at school to keep an eye on my daughter, not to make her, you know, believe that the transition is what's gonna make her happy. I believe the psychology, Send her to this uh, group, LGBT, that they have a club that they have at school. I didn't know about this at all. This opening then frames this story that way too, that things were perfect and that Evan was a perfect feminine daughter and then tells a narrative of a dark force coming in acting upon this child, allowing the parents to dissuade their feeling of a sense of failure that they don't truly understand their child when they come out as trans, instead allowing them to feel that they are the ones who know the actual truth, the beautiful perfect world that they are trying to preserve that existed before their children left their supposed safety and was influenced by the transgender agenda. But after this opening, the film presents us with its first argument through its experts, that trans people, especially non-binary and gender fluid kids, are something brand new. Our public schools have changed. Five years ago, there was no students that were identifying as non-binary. Gender fluid was not something that we even knew about. This information is presented flippantly without any actual factual basis, mostly because the film doesn't need to. It's playing off of the bias that people who had never heard of trans or gender fluid people beyond the past few years where people have been talking more openly about that stuff believe then that it must be a new thing that only occurred within the past few years because that's when they heard about it. But in truth, trans, non-binary, and gender fluid folks are by no means new. 
Throughout history, societies have recognized folks outside a rigid modern-day Western cultural, biological, and social view of gender. Take the Haraja of India, the Scythians honoring gender-variant people, mythological gender-bending characters like Loki, the Mahu of Hawaii and Tahiti, or the Talmud, a primary source of Jewish theology and religious law, recognizing somewhere between six to eight genders or sexes, as but a few examples of gender-diverse people existing before just the past few years. And by the way, it's essential to realize that none of these examples that I just mentioned perfectly match the current cultural conceptualization of gender identity and biological sex in the same way that we think about trans people today, but simply provide evidence of the numerous ways that different cultures conceptualized how gender, biology, and self-expression interacted in different ways beyond just man and woman. After many of these cultures were colonized by European countries, the rigid gender binary is often placed onto and enforced in these societies in order to force them to conform to Western culture's views of gender, usually done by the colonizers in order to dehumanize their new subjects, wishing to frame those they are colonizing as less human beasts whose gender did not match up to real human, i.e. European standards. For example, for many indigenous women, European cultures imposed ideas that women's subordination was essential to a gender dichotomy, when in actuality many indigenous tribes in America had matriarchal cultures, or what historian Chiara Botticci framed as low-intensity patriarchies that further allowed women's participation than European cultures did. When attempting to colonize these people in what would become the United States, Europeans framed indigenous women as hypersexual and sinful compared to the purity and weakness of European colonial women to conceptualize indigenous women as lesser than real women, i.e. European women. We'll return to this idea later, but I'd recommend these excellent videos by Lily Alexander and Foreign Man in a Foreign Land, or my video that I did on civility politics that goes much deeper into that specific colonialist history in relation to gender. The important thing to take away, though, is that many of these broader and different understandings of gender existed before and still exist today, such as the wide variety of gender roles often placed under the umbrella term of two-spirit in indigenous groups in the United States. Each nation's understanding of gender and sexual diversity is different and grounded in specific spiritual beliefs. Ultimately, all of this doesn't matter to the film because the idea that trans or non-binary people are new feels correct to an audience that has continually been primed with the idea that transgender people are a fad that is increasing to seemingly epidemic levels recently invading our culture. We're also having an epidemic of girls transitioning more than boys. Yet that only appears to be the case due to the active suppression of queer, trans, and gender diverse histories from the mainstream, due to its erasure by centuries of colonialist work, both within colonized nations and in Western European culture itself. The film even makes wild claims such as this. Some mom told me that in her daughter's class, there was only two students in the class that identified as a heterosexual out of probably a class of 35. Wow, fuck, that's wild, right? To go from almost no queer students to suddenly everyone is gay now. I even heard that there was a kid who identified as a cat in one school and the school put out litter boxes for them. Wild, right? Sadly, as most of us probably know by now, that last one was an actual rumor that got mainstream right-wing attention that didn't actually turn out to be the case. There is a school in Texas that someone identified, you ready for this, for a cat and they made them put out a litter box. The other students and teachers should not have to be uh, put through that. This is the film doing what right-wing narratives often do. Use supposed anecdotal claims that have no factual basis, but play off of preconceived biases that have been built up in their audiences. In actual truth though, it's estimated that only 300,000 or 1.4% of teens identify as transgender in the United States. Similarly, only one in four high school students identify as LGBTQ in some way, according to the CDC. Not 33 in 35, as the film anecdotally makes it seem. These numbers are higher than they've been in the past few decades, but most experts put that up to increased availability and accessibility to LGBTQ education online and elsewhere, meaning more students have the words to articulate what they may have been feeling regardless. Yet none of that matters over the feeling the documentary is positioning as fact. All of it is centered on anxieties and fears parents will have over their children, believing their child must have just encountered something new, some external fad that made them suddenly run against what their parents thought of them as. Further, the film, and many anti-trans narratives, let's be fair, never address the fact that the LGBTQ community actually describes a vast number of distinct identities. It then creates a false dichotomy of LGBTQ or straight, or in their mind, not normal or normal, without acknowledging that straightness describes one identity, while the queer community encompasses numerous. And this, of course, allows a false binary us versus them dichotomy to be created. 
Speaking of that framing though, this narrative of young people suddenly becoming trans raises the question the film quickly tries to answer. Where do kids get these ideas? And the answer is teachers. It follows a pattern. And that was the first entrance point for me to figure out something's going on at the school. A lot of the children and high, teenagers and high schoolers that are questioning their gender and having gender identity crisis are being driven by the teachers. Those evil damn teachers. I remember you, Mrs. Williams. I know you taught me to be trans like this. That's why you gave me a C in US history. We even get this dramatization I showed you before of Evan's teacher starting the semester just talking about John Money. So today we're gonna talk a bit about genders. You know, the term gender identity, it was coined by psychiatrist professor Robert J. Stoller in 1964. And then it was popularized by psychologist John Money. Hey middle schoolers, welcome to your first day of class. Let's talk about John Money. I'm sorry, I just can't, I just can't. Maybe none of you find this as funny as I do, but I cannot tell you how much I laughed watching this movie for the first time. It's the funniest fucking thing ever. Suffer from gender dysphoria. Does anyone know what it is? Yes, Sarah. Uh, it means if you're like born as a boy, but you're actually a girl in a boy's body, right? <laughs> Anyways, I spoke to an actual education employee who works in a progressive school district here in the United States to talk about their experiences with how parents, even in more capital L liberal areas, fell into this concern surrounding trans people. And for their safety, I'm not going to be sharing their name and an actor is going to be recording their words and you'll be hearing their comments a few times throughout this video. The twisting of what is taught also surprised me. For example, explaining to kids that there are some people in the world and in our community who don't identify as a girl or a boy, that you don't have to be a boy to be an Air Force pilot or a girl to be a nurse, was twisted into, you want my boy to become a girl. Teachers want them to have surgery and change their names. And let's be honest, they sincerely believe it is what is happening. And it's terrifying. It comes from a genuine fear bred by the same fear mongers on YouTube or TV. And when people are scared, you can't reason with them. Again, it's very few people, but they're so loud that they give you the impression that they're the only ones existing. Nobody ever sends praises anymore, so it's easy to forget that many people are happy with our work. The goal of this drama is not to build empathy for trans people's authentic lived experiences, as it so claims, but to dramatize the projected fears of parents surrounding their children, exploring a potential trans identity that right-wing narratives prey upon. Speaking of right-wing narratives, the film presents the history of one John Money through Miriam Grossman. And this is where gender-affirming care comes from. In fact, the only study intended to prove this theory of gender identity being separate from biology failed miserably, and that was the study that John Money did with the famous uh, twins, the Reamer twins. John Money is being presented here as the creator of modern day gender ideology, playing again to this idea that not only is being trans something new, but also explicitly being pushed by an external malicious force who generated it. Money's theory was widely accepted within psychology and psychiatry and sociology and gender studies was based on his fraudulent research. So let's talk about John Money. First and foremost, Money didn't create gender identity, nor was his clinic the first to provide gender affirming care. While he did found one of the first institutional gender identity clinics in the United States at John Hopkins University in 1966, numerous other academic centers had been discussed since the early 1960s in order to research and provide care to transgender patients who had even been studied as far back as the 1910s when a trans man and doctor, Alan Hart, underwent a hysterectomy in 1910. John Hopkins University's clinic was one of numerous that sprang up around this time, leading to the foundation of much of the research on trans people that we currently have today. And we already spoke about societies that had multiple gender roles for centuries, but beyond that, you can still find numerous evidence of gender nonconforming and non-binary folks throughout United States histories, especially in underserved and stigmatized communities who often felt less overt pressure to conform to a rigid gender binary in a country that was already ostracizing them. 
Even if we broaden out to a European context, there was also Magnus Hirschfeld, who founded the Institute of Sex Research in 1919 in Germany, which studied transgender people and homosexuality, mirroring Weimar Germany itself's institutional, if nominal, acceptance of transgender identities. Weimar German government even allowed some citizens to change gender markers on their government documents, similar to how some states allow people to do that in the US. With this diagnosis, the trans person would go to the police headquarters and get a photo ID stating that they are transvestite. The document would be stamped by the police chief. If this trans person were walking down the street and the police stopped them, they could show their transvestite ID and the police would refrain from arresting and charging them. Hirschfeld even coined the term transsexualism, which over the decades led to the word transgender. And it should be even clear that Hirschfeld was only studying people that he saw already existing in Weimar Germany around him. He did not generate the idea of being transgender, just provided some of the first study of transgender people in Western Europe. Much of his work was destroyed when the Nazis burned his clinic in the 1930s as they rose to power, arguing that the Jewish Magnus Hirschfeld was trying to corrupt Aryan bloodlines by turning fertile Aryans gay and transgender, one of the many anti-Semitic narratives used by the Nazis to uphold their authoritarianism and fascism that was justified through eugenic ideals of a superior race that could be bred through the Aryan bloodline, one that was, according to Nazi propaganda, being intentionally diluted by the inhuman Jews. And by the way, keep the connection between anti-Semitism and anti-trans hate in your mind, by the way, because we'll sadly be returning to it by the end of this video. But for now, the main takeaway of this is just to show how gender variant history was repeatedly attacked and erased, thus allowing further colonialist societies to claim that gender variance was new, despite it existing as long as humans have existed. Returning to John Money, he was a sexologist who became most famous for his case with David Raymer, which Grossman herself centers upon. Soon after he was born in 1966, David Reamer as a baby suffered a botched circumcision. So Money then convinced Reamer's parents to surgically alter Reamer and raise him as a girl. Money, after many years, praised the experiment as a success. But David eventually identified as a boy and chose to detransition to reverse the one that was performed on him as a kid without his consent. Riveted to this story you're about to hear, it is the ultimate in that you can't make somebody be something they're not. After this, the media sensationalized David's story, and tragically, David died by suicide at the age of 38 due to severe depression. So I wanna be very clear here, fuck John Money. He was an asshole and did terrible fucking things. Gender transformation and many right-wing anti-trans narratives focus in on Reamer's case because it is helpful to play into their idea that the idea of gender is genetically innate and is being manipulated by institutional science and its practitioners like money or the healthcare system, a narrative that is eventually in their minds funneled down to teachers who begin to sell that narrative to children. David, so the anti-trans narratives like to tell, knew deep down that he was a boy because of his biology, no matter what surgeries or hormones a sinister man like Money tried to do to him for his own perverted ends. Yet, in actuality, Reamer's case showcases much deeper issues. David's social gender and biological sex characteristics were assigned against his will at birth. His abuse at the hands of money and his own parents' decisions, which is similar to how numerous intersex folks are often forced to undergo surgeries before they are old enough to consent, by the way, underscores how forcing children to identify against their will, both in terms of their biology and in the way they wish to present their gender to themselves and to others, ultimately causes profound mental and physical harm. I didn't do it because I liked it. I did it because I wanted so desperately to fit in because I was so lonely. That is the main takeaway that we should have from David Reamer's story. And this idea has been proven over and over and over and over again by numerous studies done more scientifically and ethically than John Money ever did. David's story also emphasizes how gender, sexuality, and self-expression are part of a complicated interplay of biological, social, and environmental factors, rather than biological or social factors being the sole distinguishers of one's gender alone. We constantly try to come up with a transgender gene or a goy and girl brain that explains transgender people or saying parents or teachers or scientists are the ones that make people trans, when in actuality we see that non-binary and gender diverse people come out of numerous different factors. Nothing is ever so simple. It's why it's proven that helping people who identify as trans figure out how they wish to present and exist within the world, both physically and socially, in their own unique way, individual to each person, instead of trying to force them down a predetermined path, regardless of if it's through medical, social, or biological means, has proven to increase the quality of life, reduce suicidal ideation, and save lives.
All of this highlights how gender transformations attempts to frame a Western cultural conception of binary genders as both natural and long running, while transgender issues and an understanding of genders outside of a binary perspective are abnormal, recent, and manufactured by a medical system, when in reality, it was the exact opposite. Trans, non-binary, and intersex folks whose biological sex did not align with a binary conception have always existed, though in different forms based on their own cultural context. It was a Western culture and colonialization that attempted to codify gender as something inflexible and innate based on your genetic code coming out of eugenics ideals. We cut back to Abigail Martinez telling the story of the real-life Andrew, stating that he suffered from depression due to bullying, something we see occur in the dramatization. You know, 13, I believe, is when she was struggling with depression. Hey, how was school, honey? Fine. I made your favorite dish. I'm not hungry. Further, we constantly see the fictional Evan on his phone, learning about being trans from it or playing with gender identity through it. This leads Evan, representing Andrew, to attend a counselor session where this occurs. I look at my brother and everything seems so easy for him. And I just feel confused. Do you think you'd be happier as a boy? I don't, I don't know. Maybe you should join this club. Hot fucking damn. Let me just say this. If this were an actual therapy session, we should all be calling for that therapist's credentials to be revoked. Because here we are seeing this therapist leading Evan to a specific conclusion and outcome that the therapist had predetermined. And in a pretty overt and comical way at that, instead of letting the client lead the session and express their actual emotions. It's clear that in the way this scene is presented, Evan is just discussing the general ways that he sees the sexist distinctions in society around him that make him upset, which the therapist then manipulates into causing Evan to question his gender. It's a simple yet effective manipulation not done just by the therapist, but by the scene itself in terms of how it presents this as an actual thing that happens to an audience. Because it needs to be said, first and foremost, this is rarely, if ever, how young folks encounter the idea that they may be trans. Most students have found that students generally have started questioning their gender identity before going to teachers, therapists, healthcare professionals, or other adults in authority around them. Secondly, and this is very important, the way this scene depicted this healthcare professional dealing with transgender identity falls well outside the actual recommended guidelines for how healthcare professionals are supposed to interact and treat gender identity issues. The most recent edition of the WPATH Standards of Care for the Health of Transgender and Gender Diverse People, which are the generally accepted guidelines for medical professionals in the United States for transgender care, clearly states Statement 6.2. We recommend healthcare professionals working with gender diverse adolescents facilitate the exploration and expression of gender openly and respectfully so that no one particular identity is favored. Essentially, what that is saying is that while a healthcare professional should respect a child's stated gender identity when that child tells it to them, the professional's goal should be to allow as safe an environment as possible for the child to explore their gender identity safely without judgment, nor with a stated end goal or direction for them to move in as adolescents have differing ways and paces that they explore a possible or many possible gender identities. The majority of children with gender dysphoria um, will not grow up to be transgender adolescents or adults. But I think the challenge is that we're not able to definitively predict for whom gender dysphoria will continue and for those that it may not continue. But there is growing consensus that the more intense gender dysphoria is in childhood, the more likely it is to persist, and that puberty itself can also be a telling predictor. However, young teens, 13, 14-year-olds, those who are distraught by the changes in their bodies, they are most likely at the start of a true trans journey. They're asking themselves questions. And all of a sudden, they're in contact with a dozen other teens who are going to say, well, I did this, I took this drug, I saw this surgeon, my life's been transformed, it's amazing. I think we have to be wary of all that, as it gives them points of reference that might not be their own. I believe they should have time to reflect. The goal of a healthcare professional should be to let the child guide the path, not the way that this therapist leads Evan to a specific conclusion. Now, to be fair, not all therapists and educators and professional healthcare people may be educated on the most recent guidelines. 
But this is why we need to educate therapists, teachers, and other professionals more about trans-affirming care, not give them less, as the documentary and many anti-trans arguments attempt to persuade people to believe. I had to care for a trans student before even being educated enough about what they were going through then. They still like me, so I guess I did okay. My guiding principle is kindness. I didn't walk the path myself, and I won't feel all the pain nor all the joy, but I can be there holding hands and I'll be here to celebrate. I will give the light I have to see the obstacles coming. Sometimes it may not be enough. I think it's like caring for anybody. Do not assume. Listen, learn, read, 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 ask, 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 find knowledgeable people and be there. Be a voice. I know how tiring it can be to not be heard. And I try to be here emotionally, but also practically. Do you need a place that is not a shared locker room to adjust your binder after PE? I'll find you a spot. I'll make sure nobody barges in on you. You don't know how to talk to the new nurse? I got you. You were uneasy about the cabin arrangement at the camp? I will find a solution. I let their concerns guide me not the other way around. Unfortunately, most facilities are still not friendly to trans kids, and it took me some time to realize this, so I do my best to find solutions and push for better long-term solutions. In a broader context, I hope it prompts acceptance in the community by modeling positivity and dismantling misconceptions. I'm not afraid, so why are you? See? Everything is fine. Moving on, the only study briefly name-dropped by gender transformation occurs right after this moment. There's been studies by Lisa Littman and also the National Academy of France who are very concerned about social media influence. Kids watching, you know, YouTube and seeing someone who's taken testosterone or had a mastectomy. And if you have this mental condition and you see someone, wow, you know, I'm euphoric after I had my breast removed, that sounds like the answer. This mentioned study is, of course, because it always is, referring to Lisa Lightman's study on rapid onset gender dysphoria. For those of you who don't know what ROGD is at this point, it's a junk science theory that attempts to argue that culture, trans influencers online like myself, or children's peers are what is making children spontaneously turn transgender as a fad, influenced by social media and peer pressure as well. Transgender, it sounds so harmless. And it's made very, very cool through the media, through TikTok, through Reddit, through Tumblr, through Instagram, through Facebook, through Twitter. ROGD is completely bunk, as it was created by a research paper in 2017 by the aforementioned Lisa Lightman, based on a study that Lightman conducted that only surveyed blogs run by parents worried that their children were turning transgender. So it was very much begging the question. As John Oliver himself put it, it's like citing a study claiming that all postal workers are terrifying hell demons sent to attack your family, but then learning that the researchers only surveyed a collection of anxious dogs. <laughs> That's some heavy sampling bias that clearly skewed your results. It should be mentioned that the blogs that ROGD based itself on were frequented by the same types of parents that Gender Transformations is marketing itself to. Many scientific organizations widely criticized Lightman's paper, and numerous other studies after the fact with better run methodologies even came to opposite conclusions as that paper. Despite this though, Lightman's work is often cited by anti-trans organizations from PragerU to The Daily Wire to Gender Transformations to lend a supposed scientific credence to the idea of a cultural contamination of transgender influence. This leads to gender transformations generating the false anxiety that kids are being manipulated into identifying as trans due to social media, cultural pressures, teachers, and therapists. There's this weird narrative of trans people convincing themselves that they're trans or their friends convincing them that they're trans. Most of us, every, certainly every single trans person I have talked to, went through this phase of like intense denial of like, no, that's not me. I, I can't be trans, absolutely not. I'm just, I'm just cis and, and confused. I'm just cis and confused. That's what, this, it's what we want because yeah. we don't want to deal with all the bullshit that goes along with being a trans person. Mm -hmm. But of course, here we are. Yeah. All of this narrative that we have been discussing so far is given further supposed credence by the film's next presented guest speakers in the Talking Heads sections, the several young detransitioners that the film introduces us to, Chloe Cole, Abel Garcia, Kat Cattison, and David Bacon. All four of these detransitioners present the idea that they are pushed and guided into identifying as transgender by a teacher, social media, a therapist, or someone else in adult authority above them, but later regretted it and suffered long-term mental and physical harm as a result. I think having both college professors and my peers validate my belief that I could be a man in a female body, I think it did 
pushed me over the edge to transition. Now, these detransitioner stories will be continually referred to throughout the film, echoing Abigail Martinez's story about her son and Evan's fictional narrative about the real-life Andrew. So, considering that it's such a heavy part of the film, we must pause to consider who these detransitioners are and why they're here in this story. Let's start with that second part, the why they're here. Narratives that transgender-affirming care is harmful to children often lean on the statement or implication that detransitioning in transgender people is widespread with even some claiming that thousands of transgender youth regret transition. With numbers even up to 80 to 90% of the trans community being cited on places like Fox News, 7 News in Australia, and even the state of Montana's legislative hearings against transgender care. And it was not disclosed to her family or to her that, that for example, uh, teenage transitioners desist from transition at a 80 to 90 percent rate that the majority of people who go through this uh, regret it later on. This incredibly wild and high claim often proves to be intentionally overblown or anecdotal. For example, when the state of Florida attempted to pass anti-gender affirming care laws arguing that there was a wave of detransitioners, the state could actually not find a single detransitioner to bring to support the claim, despite Florida having an estimated 90,000 transgender populace. We could also look at Jamie Reed, who is an employee at a Missouri gender clinic, who claimed to be a whistleblower who kept a list of detransitioners who were treated there. But when people looked at that list, it actually only contained 16 names out of the 1,200 transgender people that were treated at the clinic, or in other words, only 1% of the people that were treated at the clinic. Only two were substantiated by the New York Times. Many, including 60 Minutes itself, try to cite the rdtrans subreddit, which has 50,000 subscribers, to try to argue that there is a large detransitioner populace. We found a Reddit detransition support group with over 19,000 members worldwide. But a poll on the subreddit hints that most in the group are probably just curious about the subject and not actually detransitioners themselves. If we turn to more trusted sources, a 2015 survey by the National Center for Transgender Equality found that only 0.4% of respondents had detransitioned because they thought that transition wasn't right for them. A 50-year Swedish study published in 2015 found that only 2% of people that participated regretted transitioning. This number is substantially lower than the 17% of people who get cosmetic plastic surgeries and later regret it, for example, a fact that does not lead to an outlawing of said surgeries. But when it's potentially up to 2% of trans people, most of whom aren't getting surgeries themselves, by the way, that's when we argue that we need to stop all of transition-related surgeries and care. In the end, the detransitioner issue, compared to the 1.6 million transgender people who live in the United States, is relatively small. Despite this, Gender Transformation offers up four young detransitioners and never interviews the predominant amount of transgender people who end up having happier and healthier outcomes due to trans-affirming care, displaying what most anti-trans narratives attempt to do, overemphasizing detransitioner stories to make it appear like a larger scale problem. I want to be very clear that I'm not arguing that detransitioner stories are not important, not in the slightest. I think it is actually very, very important that we listen to and discuss detransitioner stories as part of the ongoing discussion surrounding transgender affirming healthcare. But what this means, though, is that detransitioner stories are not arguments for less trans affirming healthcare to be given, as they are often propped up to argue for, but for more and better trans affirming care. Let's take Abel's story, for example. Abel states that he had a letter for hormone replacement therapy to go on to estrogen from his therapist right after his first session. And I told the therapist, I think I might be transgender, but I don't really know and I need your help. Immediately she informed me as a transgender woman. And when I asked her why so quickly, she said she did not want to gatekeep me. And she had my letter to transition right away with hormones on my first session with her. If we are to take him at his word, his medical professional was either not educated on or didn't care to follow the trans-affirming care proper guidelines. According to the WPATH, to seek medical intervention of any sort, be it hormones, surgery, or puberty blockers, the child must be the one to request it, which Abel seems to imply that he did not, as he states that he was only questioning at the time. Additionally, the WPATH recommends that the child be given a complete biosociological assessment in a supportive environment before getting said care. Their gender incongruence should be marked beforehand as well and clear and sustained over a period of time, 
as well as be officially diagnosed as per the ICD-11, along with numerous other factors. If the medical professional that was working with Abel had followed any of those guidelines, he may not have undergone a transition that he later regretted. And all of these detransitioners share similar stories about medical professionals who did not follow recommended guidelines for trans-affirming care, proving again the need for more, not less, access to transgender care and education and legislation that supports transgender-affirming care. I realized that, like, yes, I did want to pursue care. And what that looked like was a six-month waiting period with appointments with a doctor who specializes in trans care, knowing that I had seen a psychologist and every single time checking in and being like, okay, so we're coming up to, you know, like you're going to go on testosterone. You're a consenting adult. Here are all the, here are all the side effects. Here's everything that you can come to expect. Here are some possible complications. Mm -hmm. Here's what the surgical process looks like. If you would like to access that, that's going to be another step that you have yeah. to take. I have to approve that blah, blah, blah. Took me through all of those things. And then Leading up to my first shot of testosterone, it was three appointments, three weeks apart, six months after I had started this process. Mm -hmm. And this is informed consent. Yes. And this is because this province- As an adult too, yeah. As, as an adult, yeah. And it's because this province has good trans healthcare. So they have all the resources in place to make sure that it's not just, oh, you, you, have, you have a case of the genders, here's your testosterone, <laughs> off you go. Like, yeah, yeah. That's what happens when you don't have good trans health care. <laughs> yeah. It is incredibly important to not fall into the binary mindset of just because the right wing props up detransitioner narratives in order to argue for less of trans affirming care, that we who support trans affirming care should not care about detransitioners. It's important to not ignore their stories, but to pay attention to them, to learn how to better understand how to treat transgender people, where there are failings, and how best to guide everyone, trans or not, to happy and healthy outcomes. On top of all this, another thing that detransitioners bring up in conjunction with the film's ongoing narrative is the implication that their desire to transition did not come from being trans, but due to other internal factors that they were misdiagnosed with being trans for. Wouldn't it be better to try to resolve the underlying cause of the depression? I mean, she's a child. He. She has her whole life in front of he. her. He. Most importantly, your child is clearly showing signs of being suicidal. Abel and Chloe Cole argue that being autistic caused them to think that they were trans. A lot of my teachers and some school staff would tell my parents like, hey, your kid has um, some autistic symptoms and I think you should get her checked out. But when they did, the, my pediatrician would just tell them, would just completely dismiss this concern. Kat Caddison also argues that her eating disorder was ignored in favor of just saying that she was trans. I asked my parents to take me to a gender therapist. He affirmed me immediately. He just sort of overlooked my eating disorder and my other mental health issues that I had. Walter Heyer, an older detransitioner, tells a story of how he was sexually assaulted, which he believes led him to desire to transition in order to gain a sense of control over his body after that horrific event. His adopted brother began to sexually molest me and then I went to, a, you know, a gender specialist. When he met with me and said, you need hormones and you need surgery to resolve this conflict that you have about your gender. Well, the truth was, it was never about gender. I learned this, it was always about what happened with a purple dress and being sexually abused. And no one was addressing this. Now, first and foremost, it should be said that none of these things preclude someone from being trans. You can be autistic, you can have an eating disorder, you can have been sexually assaulted, and still be transgender as well. Secondly, if the healthcare professionals of these detransitioners had followed current transgender healthcare standards, these things would have been discussed in conjunction with their potential gender identities, not pushed to the side. The WPATH expressly recommends that all healthcare professionals receive training and develop expertise in common mental health issues that children face, including autism spectrum disorders. So again, this is an argument for better transgender healthcare. But what's more apparent is that the film is presenting these options as a way to point to familiar narratives that are often wielded to delegitimize transgender identities. Let's point to the most obvious and evident, the idea that sexual assault causes transness. Walter Hare's description of his childhood assault is horrific, and perhaps his narrative that he tried to transition to escape his childhood trauma is his truth. Yet, framing this as a typical occurrence is inaccurate and downright disgustingly harmful. 
While studies show that transgender people, especially black and indigenous trans women, are more likely to be victims of sexual violence because they are trans, not causing it, numerous other studies on top of that show sexual abuse does not have a link to someone coming out as trans later in life. What this is, is actually just a regurgitation of a long-standing homophobic narrative that queer people recruit new children to homosexuality through child abuse, perhaps most epitomized in the 1970s by anti-gay political campaigner Anita Bryant in her statement, quote, gays can't reproduce, they have to recruit. Around the same time in the 1970s, ex-gay movements propped up by far-right Catholic groups featured detransition homosexuals arguing that they had been groomed into homosexuality Echoing the rhetoric of modern-day detransitioners like Walter Hare or the narrative of a social fad and contagion amongst youth that films like Gender Transformation argue is happening today for transgender people. You've been lied to. You were not born this way and you can heal. Anthony Falzerano is preaching one of the more controversial and politically incorrect gospels of the day. The Homosexuals are made, not born, he says. Um, how many of you in this room were sexualized before the age of 18. Through inappropriate early hand. exposure to sexuality Look and emotionally that. absent fathers. These ex-gay movements were used to justify gay conversion therapy camps, often run by Catholic organizations. These conversion therapy camps were incredibly harmful to the numerous LGBTQ people who were put through them, causing them lifelong mental health trauma. It is so subtle and so insidious in some places that you don't even recognize that you've been damaged from it. This created a lot of dissonance for me between me and my family members. Uh, for about 12 years, I was suicidally depressed. Leading to the modern day movement of attempting to ban conversion therapy throughout the United States and the UK. However, while there has been some success to ban conversion therapy for sexuality, it is still actively being pushed for transgender people today such as in the UK, where a bill that was attempting to ban conversion therapy was denied coverage to trans people as well. Despite numerous studies showing that conversion therapy for trans people is just as harmful as it is for the rest of the queer community, all built around a repackaged version of the ex-gay movement rhetoric. For trans people, they're proposing that they, they keep conversion therapy going, which is absolutely disgusting. They're trying to split the LGB community from the trans community and I'm here to protest against that to ensure that conversion therapy is banned for trans people as well. Moving on, as for Kat's argument that her eating disorder was her main problem, again, this doesn't preclude her being trans. Studies have shown that transgender people are actually more likely to face a greater risk of developing an eating disorder, up to four times more likely, often stemming from body dysphoria related to their gender identity. This brings us back finally to the claim that autism causes transness. This is one that is hinted at and emphasized several times throughout the documentary. I had a lot of underlying issues before transitioning. When I was younger, I was diagnosed with ADHD, but I believe I, that I actually have um, autism and I didn't really get consultation for that until after I stopped transitioning when I, was, when I was 17. This is unsurprising, given that the idea that autism might be the cause of being trans often crops up in arguments around trans people not really being trans, such as we can see in gender-critical feminist Abigail Schreier's Irreversible Damage book. Many of the parents I spoke to told me their children had some version of high-functioning autism. In the course of researching this book, I learned two disturbing facts about autism and its treatment. Like gender dysphoria, the diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder has skyrocketed in the last decade, and many clinicians specializing in autism are actively encouraging gender exploration in their autism patients. They may all be right, but I couldn't help wondering whether the process of diagnosis wasn't itself altering the outcome, helping to convince suggestible daughters that there really was something wrong with them. God. Fuck. Oh, you always give me the gross shit. This fear that autism causes transness is linked to a few different things that are actually based in scientific fact. The foremost of which is that studies have found that 14% of transgender people are diagnosed as autistic versus only 1% of the general population. However, there have been no definitive findings about why this might actually be the case. Despite that though, those arguing against gender affirming care for trans people often argue that being trans is just an intentionally done misdiagnosed autism. And they use a few different arguments to make this claim. The first argument that they make is that autistic people are more likely to have a binary dichotomy way of thinking and are more likely to be able to be hoodwinked into believing that they are actually transgender. 
I think people who have black and white thinking and cling to rigid social rules are more likely to be hoodwinked by people who want to do them harm. Does that not bother you? People who cling to rules are more likely to buy into ideologies that enforce them. Gender is one example of this. It reinforces gender norms. Another argument they make is that autistic people who experience sensory perception issues are more likely to experience discomfort with their changing bodies during puberty and then might wrongfully conflate this discomfort with being transgender. Now, these arguments were debunked by several studies, including this one, which highlights that there is a higher number of non-binary identifying autistic trans people than there are non-binary allistic or non-autistic folks, which disproves the argument that autistic people are likely to conform to gender expectations. It's also worth noting that that first argument is based on the infantilization of autistic people that were more likely to be hoodwinked by someone else, but we'll come back to that later. Secondly though, numerous studies found that there was a lower rate of autistic transgender people who experience sensory aversions than there are cisgender autistic people who experience the same, disproving the idea that discomfort with bodily perception during puberty is the reason that we are seeing more autistic transgender folks. In truth, there may be many reasons, and perhaps even reasons working in conjunction with each other, that explain why we see a higher rate of transgender autistic folks than allistic folks, that are better explained through a correlation of these traits, not an assumed causation. For example, autism diagnoses in children has increased in the past decade, especially in those seen as girls, due to a more significant study of autism as it presents outside of cisgender boys, who were the primary folks studied for decades until very recently when it came to autism. Secondly, studies have found that autistic people are more likely to be self-aware of how they do not fit into gender expectations placed upon them by society, and thus less likely to conform to them, but instead just be themselves, thus allowing us to be more ready and faster able to understand that we are trans before our allistic peers. This would mean that there are no more transgender autistic folks than there are allistic folks, just more autistic folks who realize that they are transgender before their allistic peers. And I'd recommend this wonderful video by Ponderful or this book by Laura Kate Dale for more info on that specific topic. However, despite this clear showcase that autism does not delegitimize a transgender identity, the reason both gender transformations and other anti-trans narratives constantly bring up this link between autism and being trans is quite apparent. It's an attempt to use an ableist infantilization of autistic people to argue that autistic trans people are not really trans and that we're also not able to make determinations about our own self and body. A lot of girls who are high functioning autistic, you know, they tend to fixate and they, ha they are particularly susceptible to fixating on the idea that they might be a boy when it's introduced to them. So uh, yeah, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. And they are one part of this phenomenon, but they're a big part. It literally just said, and here comes the ableism, mm -hmm. like after a certain, because it just, I was waiting for it. I was mm -hmm. like, when are we going to mention autism? Ah, uh, yes, there it is. Mm -hmm. There's the autism. It hits my brain like a, like a bowling ball. And I'm just like, so just the, the, the many different things going on here just is, is so utterly ridiculous and over the top. So they specifically go after these autistic girls because they can combine this erasure of AFAB autistic people with the misogyny of you know like oh think of think of the think of the children oh these poor like confused girls who are being you know and then being lost to this like transgender craze so that they can't be like broodmares for society anymore sorry scratch that last part like the way that they do that thing the way it converges with this weird misogyny that they express it's this almost like validation but then they take it away thing where mm -hmm. they they act like they say you know these Teenage girls want to be boys because their life would be easier. So are you saying that if they transition, then yes, they are boys? And it like, are you recognizing that that is exactly what is happening and then their lives improve? Because then they'll say like, no, you'll never be, you'll never be a boy. Mm -hmm. You'll never be a man. You're definitely still like, you're, you're, you're still, you are biologically female and that's how your life is going to be forever. It's like, can you guys make up your mind? Can you like, can you, yeah. can you pick one? Yeah. Cause that is something that, and maybe I'm not explaining it well, but I've tried to wrap my head around it many, many, many times when dealing with TERFs. It's always brought up in a way to remove agency from the person who is coming out 
And it's like, why is this relevant? The only way it's relevant is to infantilize the person, to take away this person's ability to see their be be seen as a full person. You see the same thing in the autistic community of like autistic people can't they can't make choices for themselves. They can't they they can't really understand. They can't ever give informed consent. It's this infantilization that comes hand in hand often with misogyny and viewing trans men and cisgender women gen- together as like objects versus you know men and trans uh, women as like you know, violent, you know, aggressors uh, that need to be, you know, fought back against. And by the way, if you haven't caught on now, if you're new to this channel, yes, I myself am an autistic transgender woman. So I know a lot about this stuff, not just from the scientific studies, but from my personal experience with a lot of this stigma. And this stigma that autistic people, especially autistic children, are supposedly incapable of having bodily autonomy and that their parents are some sort of authority over them should have complete control over their choices is a common one that autistic and neurodivergent folks generally face. It is a denial of us being seen as whole human beings who are able to understand and determine things for ourselves. This ableism and infantilization ultimately points towards the more prime and anxiety that gender transformation and this anti-trans narrative around transgender kids is trying to express and draw out of its audiences. All of these things mentioned, sexual abuse, eating disorders, autism, depression, mental health challenges, and more, are things that we often do see in conjunction with the trans community, but are often seen in correlation or studies even found are even because someone is trans, rather than how the film and anti-transgender narratives try to frame it them causing transness. This is the goal of many anti-trans groups and narratives, to play off of correlation biases or to flip the idea of causation. Take, for example, this handy table created by the anti-trans advocacy group parents of rapid onset gender dysphoria kids, which looks scientific, with it being a circle and all, that showcases the causes of gender dysphoria, with actually being transgender, this little tiny circle over there. All the information on this graph, though, is, of course, citation needed. Yet this is the film and anti-trans narratives generally attempting to manipulate a parent's perspective. A parent may have noticed abuse, depression, autistic tendencies, and other aspects that we've been discussing before their child came out as transgender. Thus, parents end up believing that one caused the other because they saw one first. However, a child may have experienced feelings of being trans their entire life without expressing them to their parent for numerous reasons, such as a fear that their parents wouldn't accept them or not understanding how to articulate their feelings due to a lack of education. But here, we can see how gender transformations has begun to subtly shift the focus from external apparatuses acting upon a child to a parent's anxiety over losing control of their child's autonomy. You know, I went and seek for help at school to keep an eye on my daughter, not to make her, you know, believe that the transition is what's going to make her happy. As I stated earlier, the fictional Evan story is not about him, even though he is the protagonist, but instead about expressing Abigail Martinez's fear that her child, Andrew, is expressing a sense of identity beyond her control or understanding. When you call someone a he and they're not, you could really hurt someone. I'm not following. Please. You are so not woke. Evie, sweetie, please. No. Just listen, please be careful with what you let yourself be influenced by, okay? This isn't about that. This is about you mislabeling people. Honey. And you do it too much. Hold on. Wait, wait, where are you getting this from? No, I need you to leave now. Evie. No. Evie. No. For example, early in the drama, we get hints of how much Evan's fictional mother controls his access to social media or friend groups. We look so good. Yeah, I'm so gonna post this. Ugh, I wish I had a phone. My mom would never allow it. Yeah, she's so weird for that. Yet, despite this being something that bothers Evan, the narrative of the film never actually confronts it. It just presents it. And the reason that it presents it is because it wants to incept in the viewer's mind that this is actually a good thing that Evan's mother was doing this. Because social media and friends that Evan makes throughout the film, like those he meets in the LGBTQ club that he joins, are seen as detrimental, corrupting influences that actively attempt to vilify a parent-child relationship. Take, for example, this scene that we see that features a friend that Evan makes from his LGBTQ group. Closest family are often our worst enemies. This line from this character, who is a trans masculine friend that Evan met in his queer group, makes no sense coming from them. Because we see this character has a loving home with parents who support him. It makes no sense that this character would express a distrust of parents when it comes to a transgender identity because that it's not something that he experienced. It comes literally out of nowhere. 
But the reason that the film showcases it this way is just to generate the idea that just by virtue of being trans, this friend is sinister and actively trying to turn Evan away from his mother, rather than being actually earnest. It's framing this trans person as actively manipulative. This character is based on a real-life friend of Andrew, though their characterization is based on how Abigail characterizes their friendship, not based on how Andrew would characterize their friendship, leaning into the characterization of the friend being a wedge between Andrew and his mother. And they were best friends, but what uh, this friend was friend was doing, in quote, uh, is uh, trying to convince that uh, to go into transition. Thus, subtly leading to the idea that any unapproved or outside force in Evan's life is seen as actively malicious and is trying to sever a child's connection from their parent. Thus, in the film's eyes, it needs to be limited. The film is arguing, subtly, that Evan should not exist outside of his relationship and control of his parent, and specifically, his mother. But as a result of framing the fictional Evan story this way, it's communicating that the real-life Andrew, as well as other trans kids, should be treated this way as well joining these communities that are very accepting of them. And then it also puts an us versus them mentality. It's separating kids from their parents. It's telling, you know, especially if a parent isn't affirming their gender, well, now they have an enemy in their parent, but then they can go to their teachers and they can go to their classmates and their peers to find their community and, and get really um, extreme in their gender ideology, gender identities. Andrew's life story, as told by Abigail Martinez, becomes about Abigail's anxieties of her child expressing himself beyond her agency and control, rather than what Andrew's life story should be about, him getting to have agency and personhood unto himself. The parental ownership of their children is off the charts in these groups. The language that they use, like parental alienation for when like their child goes to university and it's like, if you don't call me by my name, then don't call me. Mm -hmm. And they're like, this is abuse. I am being abused by my child because my child who I gave birth to <laughs> and therefore own <laughs> yeah. is, is not doing the things that I, I require them to do, that I need them to do. What about my grandbabies who your child reproduces with? Or even if they do, it's neither your concern, but it's also not like your choice. Mm -hmm. And the, their concerns are about things like prom or family photos or how people are going to look at them when they're in the grocery store. Like they're, they're, the complaints are so trivial compared to what the children, like, like they'll voice like their child is a suicidal ideation and depression. And then they'll like turn around and say, but she doesn't think about how hard this is on me. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, She's 14. It's all about fear. Mm -hmm. That is how they recruit the parents. Mm -hmm. They play on their fears mm -hmm. and their like disgust mm -hmm. with gender and sexual minorities. The which is very present in many of these parents. Like the way that they talk about their trans kids mm -hmm. is sick. Let's go back a little bit, though, to the scene of Evan visiting an LGBTQ group to talk about this a little bit more. Before we get to the scene in the film, an expert comes on screen to introduce the concept of queer groups this way. Notice how she frames this club. We put these flyers around the school. It didn't disclose a time or a place. We told them to come to our office, and we'd do a little screening, a little interview, and then we'd secretly tell them when and where the group was. And then we'd tell them that they didn't have to tell their parents and that we wouldn't tell their parents. In fact, we didn't even tell the teachers or the administration of the school. They didn't even know. That's how secret it was. As if it's a secret, dark, clandestine group kept from parents, feeding again into the anxiety of losing parental control. Yet, in actuality, this is not how any LGBTQ group operates. Most LGBTQ groups in high schools and middle schools are student-run safe spaces where queer kids can socialize and find support with peers. And studies have shown that these types of groups in schools can lead to improved mental health outcomes, not just for queer students, but also lead to a reduction of bullying and harassment generally. The reason being is that these groups normalize the idea that people can be different and that it's okay. Additionally, kids have every right to be able to form groups with their peers based on mutual interests or identity. 
universities. But these rights of students have been constantly under attack by the right wing. Bills in Ohio, California, Florida, Arizona, and numerous other states in the US have been introduced or passed that force teachers to notify parents whose students are transgender and also allowing parents to sue school districts if teachers don't comply. These laws have also reached places like Canada, with schools in New Brunswick and Saskatchewan legally forced to inform parents if their kids even want to use different names or pronouns, even requiring parental consent for them to do so. This is incredibly dangerous, as it might cause trans and queer students to be outed to parents who might abuse or mistreat them for being out, or simply might not accept them at all, which by the way, is also a form of abuse. Yet these bills de-emphasize children's humanity and autonomy in favor of parents' ability to know and control every aspect of a child's life. These people, when they talk about being concerned parents of trans and non-binary youth, mm -hmm. by youth, sometimes they mean early 20s. She was a trans woman mm -hmm. who is in medical school, doing very well, was uh, autistic, and the mother was considering cutting her off from her education because she was going through the steps to uh, to get <laughs> on home or replacement therapy, which is not as quick as the people in these groups allow, oh, yeah. uh, would like you to believe. And all of the comments were like, if your child is not going to respect your decision that he is not allowed to go on hormone replacement therapy, then you don't need to support your child. And here's what you should do you should try and get complete control over medical care, uh, financial decisions, like, oh, your child's autistic, you should be able to do this. Like, here's, here's a, I, that's an idea I had. Like, here's one way you can go about it. Other mm -hmm. people were like, cut, cut them off completely. If you're old enough to take hormones, you're old enough to play, pay for medical school. So I'm like, that is not how oh, age works. or yeah. money works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it is very, very often where the parents will say, no money for school. I will disable your cell phone. Basically, all of these things that I'm completely happy to pay for will be taken away if you're trans. Any attempt to um, live as they are, even if it has no, no surgery, no hormones, just, you know, just a name, pronouns, uh, presenting differently, maybe, mm -hmm. all of that is in the groups more than enough reason to completely cut off your child financially as well as from their like younger siblings mm. because they might be an okay. undue yeah, influence the, yeah the control that they have over even their adult children is far beyond the reaches of like any any healthy parenting you could possibly be doing yeah this also goes to the reason that many LGBTQ groups are sometimes kept from parents. It's because many queer kids may face overt bigotry from their parents if they find out, or are simply worried that they might, or are just not ready to come out as they don't know their identity and are just looking to explore it in a non-judgmental, low-risk space that LGBTQ supportive guidelines emphasize as healthy, as long as no specific identity is given more significant emphasis in that exploration. If a kid goes into a queer group wishing to explore that they might be queer, but ultimately learns that they are in fact straight, that's really cool. And most, if not all, queer groups accept that and understand that, especially for younger kids who haven't figured themselves out. On a personal level, every queer group that I have ever been in, even ones that I have been in as an adult, have made that painfully clear. They are welcome to everyone, even those questioning their identity, and it's okay if they end up not being queer. However, the fictional meeting in the film plays out very differently. Sinister music plays as the teacher presents and pushes kids towards queer identities. I'm so grateful, I'm so happy today that I found this and, you know, I was able to transition into, like, myself, I guess. Anyone else? So this was a group where they basically gathered vulnerable children and taught them that it was us against them because their family wouldn't understand them. Again, the film is highlighting a corrupting influence beyond a parent's oversight in a very overt fashion. This goes down to the movie, including the gingerbread person in the background, which is a visual tool used by sex education curricula to teach concepts of gender and sexuality that right-wing groups have consistently demonized since its creation in 2011. 
The gingerbread person has been so vilified because the argument is is that it's hypersexual in nature, when it's really just a tool that has nothing to do with sex. And showcases how often trans and queer identities are often conflated with being sexual or being a fetish, which neither is. This is all, this is a fetish, okay? This is a, this is a, 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 a fetish community, if we can even call it a community, and that's what it is, autogynophilia. Everything related to being trans or queer is sexualized in our society. Take, for example, this adorable genderless alien mascot who used non-binary pronouns that was created for a UK library system. Almost immediately after it was introduced, gender-critical anti-trans activists like Maya Forstarter said that the alien was attempting to sexualize children. Yet, immediately after claiming this, Maya started talking about the children's cartoon's ability to reproduce and its supposed genitalia. I mean, it's a cartoon, it doesn't have any genitals, and it's not real? So the question then becomes, who is sexualizing what here? But this speaks to the projection. How anything to do with queer or transgender issues is instantly framed as sexual when it's not because these people see it as sexual. They see anything that isn't like them as inherently marked by sex. Something that Julia Serrano talked about in her book, Sexed Up. Yeah, you thought that this was just, you thought this was just a fancy background with a floating ball. No, I have these books there for a reason. I read them. Some groups, e.g. women, are marked relative to some taken-for-granted default group, in this case men, and thus receive undue attention as a result. Essentially, marked groups are perceived as public spectacles that seem to give off phantom invitations, which is why marked groups are often falsely accused of asking for any unwanted attention that they receive. Some people in our culture, such as women, are marked by sex in the eyes of others, and this often results in their stigmatization. Intersectional marginalization arises, at least in part, from the previously described mindsets and how it can lead people to misperceive or mischaracterize marginalized groups as excessively sexual and thus marked by sex. Often, this hypersexualization goes hand in hand with political propaganda, stoking fears that the marginalized group's excessively sexual nature will have a contaminating or corrupting influence on the supposedly pure, dominant majority group. Yet these ideas that queer and trans groups are trying to sexualize children is showcased in the film, with the fictional Evan being presented with imagery of genital surgery, which seems to excite him as affirming. Uh, isn't this amazing? How science can like, actually turn you into the person you were born to be? Within hours, I can remove a body part that someone has lived their entire life being too ashamed to look at and replace it with a new body part that finally makes them feel whole. This idea that queer groups showcase pictures of genitalia to children is then emphasized by Chloe Cole to make it seem like it's a representation of actual reality. Almost immediately, I was like shown a lot of like very sexualized or like idealized content of young women. This then brings us to the next thing that we need to discuss, how gender transformations only focuses on trans men, not young trans women, seeing young trans men, who are often framed as confused young girls, as prey for predatory queer and institutional manipulations. This ultimately plays into the infantilization and dehumanization of young trans men, often seen as young girls by anti-trans narratives who need protection. That, thanks in large part to social media, there's been another population that claims to have gender dysphoria. This is a population that never before had gender dysphoria in any significant numbers. In fact, before 2007, there was no extant scientific literature on their having gender dysphoria at all. Teenage girls. What's going on? The answer is social contagion. And you have the activists who are using the other two groups to attack women and to advance their goal of chaos and social upheaval. What Abigail is leading out there, either through intentionality or ignorance, is the fact that we don't have a lot of documented understanding around trans men because we weren't studying trans men, similar to how we weren't studying many young cisgender girls when it came to autism. Hence why there was less recognition of trans men in medical history, though trans men have always existed throughout time. Trans men and cisgender girls' bodies, especially the bodies of children, are often policed in places like schools, with things like student dress codes saying that their bodies are inherently seen as sexual and need to be covered up or protected to prevent them from being prey by sexual predators, which dovetails with this desire for parents to control their bodies. 
It's important to note that trans women are rarely if ever discussed in narratives that frame themselves as sympathetic to the trans plight. Thus, if we combine this idea of the film only focusing on trans men, and how trans men and cisgender girls are often seen as needing to be protected from sexual predators, with this idea that LGBTQ groups are actively pushing sexualization onto these kids, it begins to again play into this anxiety that there are sexual predators coming for young girls, which in actuality are trans men. From here though, the idea that LGBTQ students are quickly pushed into sexualized imagery surrounding genitals is meant to highlight this concept that there is a push for them to try to get surgical or medical interventions by these external malicious forces. These medical interventions are then framed by the film as quickly given and extremely dangerous. These kids are getting put on puberty blockers like after the first visit, or they're just going straight to hormones, or they're just getting pushed through this pipeline of surgery. The film then shifts here to experts, Dr. Michael Laidlaw and Dr. Katherine Welch, who begin to condemn puberty blockers as a medication, framing it as a dangerous, irreversible drug, especially for kids with autism or suffering from depression. Again, something detransitioners like Chloe Cole give anecdotal evidence and experience with. The puberty blockers really put a hold on development. And this includes your psychological development. It includes cognitive development, your reasoning. I've seen where the person had some depression or anxiety, which over the time, over years, seems to worsen uh, with the blocker. Injections of these blockers about every three to four months. I was basically going through um, an artificial menopause. It was horrible, actually. In truth, though, none of these claims are accurate. Research has shown that puberty blockers, which essentially put a pause on puberty, are actually temporary and fully reversible in most cases, especially if only taken for a few years, which is always the case when they're given to trans youth, as puberty blockers for trans youth are just meant to give them more time to make an informed choice about if they wish to have a natal puberty or start hormones or other gender-affirming healthcare options to change their bodies to match with their gender identity. To be fair, the one significant side effect of puberty blockers that is often seen is a loss of bone density, which the film brings up. However, this long-term loss of bone density is easily addressed with calcium and vitamin D supplements, with most cisgender youth who eventually go off puberty blockers eventually having a normal natal fertility and reproductive functions and bone density. These drugs are so safe that the FDA has approved puberty blockers for youth who have precocious puberty since the early 1990s, over 30 years ago. Puberty blockers have also been shown to reduce suicidality in trans youth by 70%. Every major medical and mental health organization, including the American Medical Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the American Psychological Association, supports the use of puberty blockers as long as it's used in age-appropriate, evidence-based ways alongside a doctor who knows how to prescribe them and keeps track of how they are affecting their patients' bodies. Speaking of which, if we go back to our old friend the WPATH guidelines, we find that puberty blockers are only recommended when a child has already started the first signs of puberty, which can be a different time for everyone as everyone's bodies are different, and should only be given, according to the WPATH, for a few years until the child can decide what they wish to do next. The factual inaccuracies of this disinformation around puberty blockers are underscored by the people giving the disinformation. Let's take Dr. Michael Laidlaw, for example. Right Wing Media has regularly platformed Dr. Laidlaw, and within those appearances, he has commonly misrepresented science around transgender care. For example, he commonly exaggerates figures of transgender detransitions, even stating in his review of Jazz Jenning, a transgender author's book, that as many as 90% of trans women detransition, which is nowhere accurate. He has also numerous times directly misrepresented the findings of a study on gender dysphoria and trans, stating that the study found evidence against a genetic component to trans identity to argue that it was all a social contagion, when in actuality, if you read the study, it found that there was heavy indications of there being a significant gender component to trans identity. Again, going back to what I said before, that transgender identity is a mix of multiple different factors, including biological ones, but not limited to it. And while he mainly stays anecdotal within gender transformations, we can see him actually lying about the WPATH guidelines within the film. The Dutch really pioneered this and had 12 years old, I believe, as the earliest age. But with the endocrine society, WPATH, they've lowered this to eight or nine years old. Yet none of this is mentioned when it comes to Dr. Laylaw just presenting him as an expert in his field. Again, the film is not interested in the facts, but only in the facade of it, which Dr. Laylaw is happy to give his supposed expertise to give credence to. The fictionalized drama also emphasizes and plays into the sphere, as seen in this scene. I've talked to my doctor, he said it's just like a pause button. 
if I want to change later on, which I know I won't. But isn't that I like can. the same drugs they give to pedos to like chemically castrate them or something? Yeah, I heard that too, actually. That's extremely transphobic and super hurtful. Why would you say that? That's the very attitude that we are trying to fight. Evan's fictional peers here are not being written as real children, but just mouthpieces for right-wing propaganda. The connection to puberty blocking drugs also being used to castrate pedophiles is a typical right-wing narrative, with folks like Matt Walsh selling this exact idea to make puberty blocking drugs seem scary by connecting them to pedophilia, a common homophobic and transphobic stigma. One of the drugs used is Lupron, right? Which mm -hmm. has actually been used to chemically castrate sex offenders. But this narrative falls on its face if you think about it for more than one second, which you're not supposed to do for fear-mongering tactics to work. They just try to sweep you through without ever introspecting or thinking deeply about the facts that they present to you, just making you feel anxiety about what they're saying. The fact that puberty-blocking drugs are used for multiple different reasons have nothing to do with each other. These same drugs are also used to treat tumors in patients. Should we then stop using these drugs for tumor treatments? And this is something we'll get into further on in this video, but it's important to note that chemical castration was often used against LGBTQ people, with many countries having laws that would force queer people to be sterilized using drugs if they were found guilty of lewd acts, aka being homosexual. With perhaps one of the most famous cases being Alan Turing, the World War II codebreaker, being chemically castrated leading to his suicide in the United Kingdom. Yet the disinformation pipeline for puberty blockers playing into fears of lost children endlessly gets recycled. Take for example how the Daily Wire posted a story in late August 2022 that reported on FDA findings that linked puberty blocking drug Lupron to thousands of deaths, 6,300 to be exact. Yet if you look into it, the drug was given to terminally ill cancer patients fighting hormone sensitive cancers like prostate cancers for a specific study. It was reported by that study that over 6,000 died from cancer while also using the drug. So the 6,300 deaths that the Daily Wire article mentions are likely those cancer patients, not trans youth, a fact that the Daily Wire story deliberately left out. Moving on, at this point though, the film, both in the drama and the talking head segments, focuses on how trans youth have become thoroughly indoctrinated by the trans agenda. This is where the film spends the most amount of its time, which is understandable, given that the entire crux of the narrative hinges upon parents' fears of losing their children. Emphasis is continually placed on the idea that a parent can see the real, genuine child, knows their perfect body and soul deep down inherently. Your body is absolutely perfect. I know you don't see yourself, but I do. No. I'm a boy. Look, I know you've been going through a hard time, all right? I understand it's confusing, but a boy, I'm- I'm not confused. I know who I am, and I want to be who I am, and I want you to love me for that. Honey, I love you. God You gave love the girl that you gave birth to. God gave you this, this amazing <laughs> body, and- and you want to change it. I'm your son. Sweetie, you're confused. Just, it's, it's crazy. No. no. Evelyn. No. Get back here. And this is a common narrative throughout anti-trans media. Take the recently released gender critical book, When Kids Say They're Trans, which features this fictional exchange. Mom, I've been thinking long and hard about this and I've decided I need to change my name and pronouns. This means everything to me. It's hard to explain because you're not non-binary, but when someone calls me by my dead name, it hurts me very deeply. I just can't handle it anymore. I can see you're dreadfully upset. Why don't we sit down and have a good chat? You don't understand. I don't need to chat. I just need to go into the school and explain to the staff that they can't dead name me anymore. I hear you. However, it's not my role to take this on. My role as a parent is to slow things down when you want things sped up. I know it's really distressing for you, but you matter to me more than anything. I know I sometimes do things that might be wrong, but trying my best is all I can do. I'm simply too terrified to allow you to officially change your name. It's going too fast and I can't allow this pace of change. I'm happy to support an informal change, though. What good is that? I need it to be a proper name change, otherwise no one will take me seriously. Your name is one of the most precious words in my life. I think we'll need some further reflection on this so we can both come to some compromise. You can change your name among your friends if you wish, but adults need to offer guidance, and so we need to hasten slowly. You don't understand. This means everything to me. I can't live with the name Isabel anymore. I hate it. I'm so sorry you're upset. I really am. This exchange places the parent as the true arbiter of knowledge, yet on the back foot, just trying their best to be empathetic. 
versus a kid who is unwilling to listen and have a conversation with them. But in actuality, most kids coming out as trans are not so confident in their identity. Often coming out is an extremely fearful event, especially to parents, and kids are just trying to express themselves as best they can. Also, lines like, your name is one of the most precious words in my life, underscore so much of the way these types of books and narratives frames parenthood. That parents get to dictate in a child's identity, and that their identity is sacred, unassailable, and even almost biological, even if the child themselves wishes to choose their own identity for themselves. The book plays into parents' beliefs that they are under attack and know best about their gut instinct when it comes to a child's whole identity, especially around their gender, not the child. All of this is a subtle call to bioessentialism, the idea that genetics tells all and determines one's destiny. We can see this in the idea that a parent's gut and biological bond is more vital than a child's bodily autonomy, and that any desire expressed by said child must be due to an outside corrupting influence, not their earnest desire or their own self-expression. The film reinforces that a child's depression, for example, must come from their transition. When often, depression is due to the reverse, the fact that parents are continually encouraged to control their child's autonomy more and more and more. The main line is, trust your gut. Mm -hmm. Yep. Is that there's, there's something inside you that is uneasy or scared or confused or disgusted when your child comes out. That's your parental instincts, which are infallible because mm -hmm. parents know their children better than their children know themselves. Mm -hmm. This is stated over and over and over. They they will not shut up about that, <laughs> which is like yeah. bonkers to me because I do not know a single person, like especially like growing up, like we did not tell our parents anything. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. the, the things we got up to, the things we did, we were not like telling our parents about that. I didn't know my parents and they didn't really know me. <laughs> like yeah. that's something that you get when you're an adult, you're comfortable talking to them about who you are and they talk to you like an adult and don't like hide or like, conceal information from you or whatever. But in these groups, that's not the case. The, it is very intentionally deceptive and the relationships are so strained because the parents are saying, you don't know yourself. I know you and I need to trust my instincts on this. The film also attempts to mask the actual harm that parents can do, especially to a transgender child. At one point, Evan's parent takes him to a therapist, where both of them try to deny Evan's identity, to which Evan, who is framed as indoctrinated and ridiculous, calls it conversion therapy. Has uh, had any diagnosis before? Yeah. Mm. This is conversion therapy? Honey, you, you just said you're not sure if you be happy as a boy. You can understand my concern here, right? Mr. Well, I'm not happy as a girl. Okay, well, let's talk to Mr. Scott and let's let's try to figure it out, all right? Mom, why are you controlling me like this? I think it's a Here, we're just seeing the film saying that the mother is just trying their best to help their poor child. Yet, what the film is actually showcasing is precisely what Evan calls it, conversion therapy. Conversion therapy of transgender people is continually getting more and more prominent within anti-transgender spaces. But studies have shown that attempts to change or direct a child's sexual orientation occurs first from parents, therapists, and religious leaders. Often too, these efforts are bolstered by right-wing attempts to sell conversion-style therapy kits for money, such as the American College of Pediatrics did, an organization that attempted to make itself sound like a legitimate medical organization, but in actuality is funded by far-right groups like the Alliance Defending Freedom, and itself is qualified as a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center. The ACP sent, quote, educational resources, very heavy on the quotes there, to physicians and med school students that instructed them to teach children that same-sex marriage, for example, was aberrant. And it also sells $60 kits to parents full of games that parents can play to teach children about sexual purity and homosexuality as being natural. Again, keep in mind this idea that they're selling these things and making money off of it, by the way. We'll, again, come back to that later. But on top of all of this, one of the mothers interviewed in Gender Transformations mentions how they keep their conversion therapist secret lest they be attacked, seeming having no self-awareness that this is precisely what they claim LGBTQ groups are doing to children. I had to go out of state to find a psychiatrist who was willing to look at the causality of my daughter's new gender identity. We keep these doctors secret because if they get found out, they might 
lose their license. Again, the projection. But this is also a ridiculous claim to make because most studies show that trans and queer children have a more difficult time finding mental health services that actually understand and affirm trans identities rather than the other way around, either because they are more expensive or just inaccessible where they live. A 2015 US transgender survey found that 77% of trans people wanted to talk to therapists, but that only 58% of trans people had received any amount of therapy at any point in their life. Like I see posts like this sometimes where the parents are like, this isn't working. Like what I'm doing right now isn't helping. My child is not desisting. My child is not focusing on the things that I want them to focus on. I took them out of the gay straight alliance. I cut them off from their trans friends. I took them out of school. I cut off their internet access. I don't allow them to see affirming family members and nothing has changed except for now my child hates me. And now my child is more depressed and more like despondent than ever, what should I do? And the answer is trust your gut, that initial instinct, that's what you have to keep following. And if you read through what happens to children that go through this, mm -hmm. like there are suicide notes that have been written that name every single one of those things. And it, Sorry, it's no, no, it's it's I understand. Believe me, I know this is yeah. This is also based on the inherent medicalization and pathologization of transgender identities. Like homosexuality was seen for decades, transgender identities today have been viewed as a mental health issue stemming from things like gender dysphoria, which, it is argued, must be treated by surgeries, hormones, and puberty blockers. The World Health Organization listed gender dysphoria as a mental disorder until 2019, and while it has since been removed, the stigma of pathologization remains. Due to our society's rigidly regimented gender norms, trans people are seen as abnormal and thus assumed to have something wrong with us when we are a completely normal part of human expression and diversity going back to the beginning of human society as we discussed earlier. Gender dysphoria, while real, often stems from the incongruence between how one wishes to be treated or exist within the world and how the Western world tells them that they are supposed to be. Medical treatments like hormones, surgeries, and puberty blockers are simply tools that we have to help make someone's biological characteristics match how one wishes to exist in the world. And they are proven to make those who get these surgeries often have happier outcomes. Still, it is important to note that many trans people do not require any type of medical treatment and still can have a happier outcome. Instead, just wishing to socially transition, wear the clothes that they want to, or simply just wish to identify as trans. And all of that is equally okay despite what many trans medicalists will tell you. But ultimately, all of these things are vilified because they are viewed as other and different by a society that demands conformity. Western culture is framed as normal as correct and anything that deviates from its norms is seen as a perversion, as sexual, as abnormal. But it is only able to make things appear this way because it is built on years of erasure of other cultures' history and diversity through things like colonialization. And by the way, this fear of other cultures that may be the influence of a transgender agenda can be seen in subtle choices made in the film's mise-en-scene. Evan's mom is consistently dressed in gray pantsuits and traditional clothing, alongside Catholic imagery around her house, emphasizing her desexualization, willingness to fit into a more conservative fashion, and subtle Catholic background. Because apparently being a good Catholic means colors are bad. God gave you this, this amazing body. <laughs> Meanwhile, Evan and his friends are framed constantly with hypersexualized, colorful imagery, often connected with social media or entertainment, as well as New Age, non Catholic religious backgrounds, communicating that all of it is a corrupting force driving a wedge between Evan and his mother. While it's never overtly stated, the implications of who or what is transing the youth is very, very clear an evident fear of the other outside of the hegemonic American Catholic culture that is seen as the only normal way to exist in right wing narratives. Even more subtly, the entire narrative is the idea that children are being stolen from their parents and given a new family. Enemy and their parent, but then they can go to their teachers and they can go to their classmates and their peers to find their community and, and get really um, extreme in their gender ideology, gender identities. They even took off the license plate from their car. So there is no way that I was gonna figure out who until the police visit the car who pick up my daughter. That was the last time that I spent with my dad. The idea that queer supportive folks are stealing the children from good Christian mothers. And if that narrative sounds familiar to you, keep it in mind for our next section of this video. And hint, it rhymes with Flood Bible.
All of these fears climax in the narrative structure, with Evan, the fictional character, being taken away from his mother by social services. This is framed as Abigail's parental rights being taken away by a system that worked to drive a wedge between her and her child. Police told me that you're gonna see your daughter in court, that she was accusing me of being uh, abusive towards her. The school psychology is the one who uh, recommend DCFS, the Department of children to remove uh, from our home. We then see Evan living in Child Protective Services, which is framed as being living in 1984, given drugs to make him dead inside, and his family is pushed away from him by his queer friend and new family. Mom is so worried about you. She's being accused of child abuse. Yeah, well, it is abusive to not accept who someone is. We miss you so much, Evan. I want you to come home. I miss you too. Yeah. Come Leave on. him alone. He's going through enough to have to deal with you. He needs support right now. Yeah, but you need to stop manipulating my sister. What are you doing? Are you are you okay? What? What is this? This story is contrasted by the real-life story of Andrew Martinez, who was taken from his mother Abigail and placed into the foster care system in Los Angeles by the Department of Children and Family Services. However, there are a few critical differences in the fictional narrative and the real-life narrative that doesn't even appear in the film. Abigail argues in the film that the state took Andrew from her because she refused to accept his identity as a trans man, because she knew what the actual truth of his identity was. Yet, what's interesting is that denial of a child's affirmed identity was not, at the time, a legal metric that one could use to determine if a child should be put into foster care in California. So this narrative is dubious, but it is one that is very clear in its intention why it appears in this film. Because California Bill AB 957 was introduced in 2023, the same year that this film came out, and would require courts to interpret a child's health and safety to include a parent's affirmation of their child's identity. This bill has also been a regular target of anti-trans focus and specific anti-trans groups as of late. Even Chloe Cole has appeared in California speaking against the bill. So this is the film presenting this narrative in order to vilify a bill that is coming out today, not the actual narrative of what happened to Andrew in real life. As legally, it could not have happened the way that Abigail presents it. Now, I did try to do some investigative sleuthing into why Andrew was taken from Abigail, losing publicly available information and trying to protect Andrew's private information as best I could, but there wasn't much confirmed. However, what I was able to find was sources that share more details of Abigail's version of events that give further info of her side of why Andrew ended up in foster care that didn't end up in the film itself. Supposedly, according to Abigail in these sources, Andrew was depressed and tried to die by suicide, overdosing on allergy medication, which is what caused CPS to make regular visits, checking up on him. So, if this is to be believed, as Abigail states, Andrew being taken away by social services was not out of the blue or without an inciting incident, as the film attempts to frame it as. It was only after Andrew was taken away from Abigail that he legally changed his name and pronouns. The film dramatizes that Andrew's friends supposedly convinced him to go to court to ask to be placed in foster care, but I couldn't confirm this. So she was sent to this group home. This family kept contact with her, coaching her what to say, what to do uh, from our home. However, we can glean more specifics from Abigail herself. Abigail states she took Andrew to conversion therapists, and only after he was taken away by foster care did she choose to use his name and pronouns, motivated solely by her desire to get him to come back home rather than an earnest desire to accept his identity on his terms. So I was trying my best to please this uh, system so they can leave my daughter alone with us. She asked me to buy just boy clothes. And I did. I try even call her her first name that she chose and to check, you know, that's going to make her comfortable because she didn't belong to that group home. She have a family who loved her. All of that speaks to a potentially controlling home environment for Andrew by Abigail, which is already being heavily investigated by the CPS when Andrew supposedly asked to be placed into foster care. I can't know anything for sure, but it does speak to a very tense and potentially at least emotionally abusive environment and unsafe environment for Andrew caused by Abigail herself. 
Yet ultimately, the film is framing the story this way to vilify currently under attack bills like AB 957 and remove Abigail and vicariously other parents from potential culpability in their child's depression and mental health stemming from their denial of transgender identities. Despite it being very clear that denial of Andrew's identity was not the legal reason that he was removed from Abigail's care. In fact, conversely, there has been more legislation in the United States past to take children away from parents if they do affirm the child's gender, labeling them as child abusers as we've seen in states like Texas or Florida, despite clear medical research showing that these parents are doing and seeking the best possible care for their child. What they're doing to the parents is sick mm -hmm. at the same time, because the people running this group, they know the stats. There's a reason why they delete any comment that talks about suicidality in trans youth or the possibility that it, it could even happen. They outright lie and say that all of those statistics are made up. You know, sometimes there's like this rhetoric uh, like uh, on the left or in like trans spaces where we're like, oh, that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. When people are like, oh, they're, they're kidnapping children and making them go through surgeries or whatever. We're like, that doesn't happen. They say that about uh, queer and trans youth um, uh, dying by suicide. Further, Evan in the film is depicted as being quickly given transgender surgeries. LGBT was there uh, coaching her, um, telling her that this was the right age to do it because the state of California will pay for all the transition surgeries, uh, medication, the hormones, everything. The judge was the one who signed the form, the permission to allow her to start the treatment. But in contrast, there is no evidence that that happened for Andrew. Trans patients seeking to get any surgeries, according to WPATH guidelines, should only be able to do so after working for a long time with guardians, therapists, and doctors to determine if it's first the right choice for them, and secondly, if it's safe for them based on their own health. On top of that, most trans patients have difficulty accessing these surgeries due to them being often prohibitively expensive, denied by insurance, which is itself expensive, or having huge bureaucratic barriers like the need for several therapist approvals or having long wait times. Or on top of that, they're not being trans affirming healthcare available to them in their area. So that's just completely bunk nonsense on its face. But it does lead to a scene where Evan is taken in for top surgery in an emergency room. So, so are there any risks? No, no risks. And uh, we, we got everything covered, I assure you, Mrs. Connor. So right now I need you to leave the ER so we can get on with the operation. That was the weirdest thing I have ever seen in my life. That was so bizarre because she's in, she's just in the operating room for some reason, which yeah. is not a thing that happens. They don't know you cannot be in the operating room. And they say, I think they say, get out of the ER. So I guess it's an emergency response top surgery, which is something <laughs> I've never heard of before. So like, surely they meant OR. What was that scene? And this is, I'm, oh. this, I know this isn't relevant. It's just like, what was that? That was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. You like, thing too, and it, like a it, child into the hospital to get an emergency mastectomy. mastectomy. Like that's- <laughs> Well, it's, it's, it goes to like, it goes to two things. That element of it is just to say like, look, you can get these things really quickly and easily. Like they, they give them out, like you can walk into a, an ER and get a mastectomy any day. And just like, look how quick they're trying to trans your children. They're just really shoving them through. So that's like what that is like hinting at. And then the other thing too that that seemed like also was fascinating to me was like the way that the doctors talked about uh, Evan. While he is still conscious on the operating table, like they are very much objectifying his body as he's listening, which is like no way that I've ever heard a doctor talk to a patient, in, like at least in my experience. Like, So we'll start by removing the breast tissue and afterwards we'll... Uh... We'll replace his nipples. My anesthesiologist um, like came in and hung out with me beforehand. Mm -hmm. And then like when I went under, um, he was just like, so like, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you some drugs in a minute. But beforehand, I want you to imagine the best place you've ever been. Mm -hmm. And I want you to close your eyes and think about being in that place. Mm -hmm. And once you're there, I want you to take a deep breath and count back from 10. And he just had this, like, it was like ASMR. Like yeah, I, yeah. like it was, it was, it was, it was a magical experience. And ultimately revealing how terse and gender critical folks view also these quote unquote young girls as objects as well.
Yeah, oh. yeah. To, to just chop them up and make money. The film then cuts back to our good friends the detransitioners, who explain how hormones and surgery irreparably harm their bodies. Some of them, most notably the women detransitioners, remain vague about it, like Chloe Cole. Before I was medically transitioning, I was a perfectly healthy girl. Why is it that my skin grafts are failing two years after my surgery? If the science is there. Yet for men like Abel, their health is overemphasized, like the fact that he has shakes from his surgeries that don't stop. The removal of the implants had left so much excess skin that it looked like I had gynecomastia. Left half of my body shakes on its own uncontrollably. I don't know what caused that, if it was the hormones, if it was the surgery. Besides that, other side effects, health issues, uh, my genitals are, have atrophied, so I have really tiny genitals. To be clear, all surgeries, every surgery, comes with some level of risk, and it is very possible that Abel is suffering from such a complication. However, all medical doctors are required to explain these risks beforehand to patients. In my own experience, I have had several different trans-affirming surgeries, and before each of them, I had many meetings with my doctor who explained to me what the potential downsides were for those surgeries. But with that being said, most gender-affirming trans healthcare comes with lower risks of complications than things like cosmetic plastic surgeries, for example, and often result in favorable long-term outcomes for patients, with a regret rate of only 1%. Now, there are some studies that do find that depression immediately after surgeries does occur for patients, but that mostly comes from the fact that it takes time, often up to a year, to recover from surgeries to see full results. I can say from my own experience, after I got my bottom surgery, I was actually very depressed for several months due to a complication of numerous factors, not the least of which is that it fucking hurt and I could barely walk. But now, several years after the fact, I am very happy that I made that choice and I would make it again in a heartbeat. All of this is not to say that we shouldn't care for patients who suffer complications from these surgeries, but instead that we should ensure high standards for these surgeries in order to prevent these complications. But if you continue to outlaw trans-affirming surgeries, even though many trans people want them, you are often pushing trans people to go to places that have less standards in order to get said surgeries, which also incidentally cost them more money to do so. So to use Abel's story in this way, to frame the idea that transgender surgeries often result in complications is ridiculous and incredibly harmful. That being said though, it should be noted that if you look into these detransitioner stories, the actual root causes for the health complications and situations that these detransitioners discuss within this film as being caused by their transition-related healthcare is actually not directly due to their experiences with the transgender-affirming care that they claim that they were given. Let's take David Bacon, for example, who states in the documentary that he was given two weeks to live directly due to his hormone therapy, which is an incredibly shocking claim. They put a, a small amount of estrogen with a large amount of blocking of testosterone to block my testosterone from being developed. And then I felt down, I felt tired, I felt exhausted. I felt, my mom said I looked like a pale ghost. Like I wasn't getting enough oxygen, my fingers were looking purple, my toes were turning purple, I was, blood circulation and my legs were lacking. During that time, about two years in, I actually ended up developing a polyp in my, um, uh, my colon. I asked them what was the cause of it and they said, well, you have a high estrogen level in your system and you're a man, technically. My cardiologist stepped in. I was getting blood clot blockage. He said, okay, we're gonna have to do a surgery. Come to find out, I had two weeks to live. Yet, what David in the documentary failed to mention is that David suffers from pulmonary atresia, where the valve that controls blood flow between the heart and lungs doesn't completely form, making blood flow to the lungs incredibly difficult. David had had nine open heart surgeries in his lifetime since he was a child, even before he'd had any form of trans-affirming healthcare. And by the way, everything that I'm discussing here are details that David himself has shared publicly elsewhere, in case anyone was worried that I somehow dug up his medical history without his permission. Despite the film's narrative implying that David began transitioning as a child, in actuality, he began taking hormone replacement therapy at the age of 23. Before that time, while he did talk to his parents about it, his parents actively denied him being able to identify the publicly the way he wished to identify. After coming out and beginning the transition, David moved away from his parents up into Seattle, where he ended up homeless, which is sadly all too common a story for trans women who are mistreated and discriminated against in society. Eventually, after experiencing abuse from a partner, as well as being homeless for a long time, he moved back into his parents' home at the age of 25. 
And it's here, when he was back under his parents' care, that David claims that he began to doubt his transition. His parents also actively sought him a psychologist that did not believe in gender transition, who he discusses as convincing him that he was never actually gender dysphoric, and was instead quote unquote just autistic. Fitting right into the conversion therapy and infantilization and denial of transgender identity narrative that we have been discussing this entire video. This is entirely supposition, to be clear, but given that David's parents actively denied his ability to identify as trans when he was young, I wonder at the correlation of David starting to questioning his transition once he was back living with his parents and requiring them in order to be able to have housing. But despite this, David did stay on the hormone therapy for another two years, until the age of 27, when David experienced further health complications related to his heart, eventually leading to the story that he mentions within the documentary, with a doctor telling him that he would die in two weeks if he didn't stop taking hormone replacement therapy. I was living as a woman right up until the doctors told me I had two weeks to live. I chose life. So here, we can clearly see that a lot of important context in David's story is intentionally left out of the film. First and foremost, he was on hormones for around four years before this health situation occurred. Secondly, it's important to note that David probably could not afford good health care while he was homeless, which is probably what led to his further health complications, but also important to note that he didn't have any health complications related to his transition-related care during that time. On top of this, David had a pre-existing condition that created a complicating factor for his hormone replacement therapy, which would require consistent doctor oversight as the WPATH states. Again, if we look at the truth of David's situation, all of this is why we need to fund more healthcare and make healthcare both trans-specific and generally more accessible to those who cannot afford it, not less. It also showcases how the proven systemic discrimination against trans women in housing, healthcare, and employment compounds all of these issues, including the ones of parental control that I talked about earlier. On top of all of this, and I want to be very clear, I am by no means aiming to delegitimize David's current identity, but it does make me wonder why David only considered detransitioning after experiencing so much hardship as a trans woman and also going back into his parents' care, whom he admits actively discouraged him seeking trans-affirming care due to their religious beliefs in his youth, despite him admitting to have expressed such feelings since he was 10 years old. All of this important context is left out of these discussions surrounding detransitioning healthcare complications, instead making it seem like solely the trans-related healthcare that caused their healthcare concerns. This is something that happens consistently when it comes to how detransitioners are propped up and utilized within anti-trans narrative groups. Lee Levine, for example, a Jewish former detransitioner who worked directly for a detransitioner advocacy group that was connected with right-wing organizations, spoke out about how she experienced vision loss while on hormones that the organization used to then vilify trans-related care, but was actually in truth caused by genetic reasons that Levine faced. Trans people experiencing distress in relation to transition, whether medical or due to societal or familial pressure, are pressured to frame that distress in very particular ways. Oftentimes, the people doing the pressuring think they're helping, shower you with sympathies, dissuade you from further efforts, reduce the pressure by changing yourself. The world won't or doesn't need to change. Rid yourself of the delusion and you'll feel better, promise. I never did feel better. In many ways, I felt worse. I drank, quit my job, moved out of state, and got involved in organizing that depended on these ideas, again, under the guise of helping people like me. I became steeped in it in the midst of a medical crisis, and it was killing me. As my vision got worse, and with it my isolation, I eventually tracked down an event the NFB was holding called Ask a Blind Person. Its members were eager to help me find the resources I needed, not based on some expectation of what my experience should be, but based on what I thought was going to be helpful. This turned out to be what I needed the entire time. That connection meant giving me suggestions on assistive technology to install, some of which I use for work now, or what features to enable to reduce some of my discomfort. They gave me the aforementioned referral, but most importantly, they gave me complete, unconditional acceptance and support. It didn't matter how I got there, just that I was there in the same position many of them had been themselves. Sure, I had a whole story surrounding my vision loss, like many others there did, but there wasn't any expectation of me telling it or doing anything with it if I didn't want to. And no one asked. And so then I find myself sitting in front of this eye doctor telling him my story, and he picks up on a clue that had been missed by the others, my progressive night blindness. 
He then began to describe the rods and cones in my eyes, the cells that process light and send the signals to the optic nerve for the brain to interpret. And he talked about how, in some instances, they begin to malfunction. Retinitis pigmentosa, a collection of conditions where the rods and cones deteriorate over time until they eventually die. They're genetic and have no cure. Moving back to the film, though, the thing that gender transformations most significantly emphasizes as a harm caused by trans-related healthcare is the loss of reproductive health especially for girls slash trans men. This is incredibly important for everything that's about to come after this section, because the fear here being stressed is not about the loss of life opportunities for these kids, but the young girls, aka trans men's, ability to reproduce. First and foremost, while trans women like myself can become infertile while on hormones and definitely after surgery will, most trans men, again, not all, but most trans men won't lose the ability to reproduce unless they've had a surgery like a hysterectomy. Top surgeries, like the one that Evan is shown getting, will not prevent or ruin someone's reproductive health. Secondly, again, to reiterate, potential loss of reproductive ability is communicated to trans people at every point of transition where it may be relevant, so it's not a shock to anybody if it happens. However, the emphasis and concern from these narratives is always eventually leading to a place of worry around the loss of reproductive ability. This dovetails with the other fear that is being expressed of the loss of sexually attractive traits to heterosexual men on the bodies of these trans men. This is a discussion of the loss of their breasts or how they will ever be able to find a man when they have a deep voice. Their fuckability for lack of a better word, which is fucking gross. Very pretty girl going through a bad period where she was depressed and then some perverts and, and psychos and, and idiots. I mean, to be, to be fair to them, some of these people might just be stupid, but I think a lot of them are just perverts and they're, they're preying on people's confusion. They take advantage of this. It's destroyed my health. I don't know if I'll ever be able to conceive a child up and down the country and around the world, girls are removing breasts that have never known a lover's caress. It's again only viewing women's bodies or trans men's bodies as being something for use by heterosexual men. Repeatedly, in not only gender transformations, but across all anti-transgender discussions surrounding transgender children, it's all going to emphasize the objectification of specifically white trans men and cisgender girls. They are infantilized, lied about, placed as victims, and only discussed for their ability to reproduce and how sexually appealing they are. All of this leads into Gender Transformation's final segment, where it tries to offer up a why all of this is happening to young transgender kids. The first major talking point that it brings up is that these surgeries and transgender affirming healthcare generally is making tons of money, which is a common anti-trans talking point. There's definitely a money trail towards having these transgender patients as lifelong medical patients. What we're seeing with the, the medical companies, the medical device and the pharmaceutical companies when they can fund the activists and the NGOs to stir up a lot of passion. Hey, we need this, we're suffering, we have gender dysphoria, we're gonna commit suicide if, if we don't transition. There's a demand then for it. And then the, the companies, the medical schools, the, the hospitals that say, oh, well look, all this demand, we have to have some emergency use authorization. We have to start doing research, we have to start doing this because it is a mental health crisis among our youth. Basically using the for-profit medical industry that we have in the United States as proof that being transgender is pushed on children so that big pharma can make money. And it's understandable why they lean into this idea, right? We here in the United States very much know that the healthcare industry is trying to milk us for every dollar. The insurance and medical industry constantly increasing its prices for necessary healthcare is a horrible problem that every person in the United States faces. So certainly pointing at the big medical industry as the problem will easily lead into a presupposed fear and bias in the audience that gender transformations is selling itself to. Because yeah, the medical for-profit industry is fucked up. But if you think about this for even a moment, you realize that this argument against trans healthcare makes no sense. 
Insulin is a needed drug for diabetics, for example, yet its price continues to rise as drugs are controlled by pharmaceutical companies who benefit from lax regulations around drug prices, leading to ridiculous prices of necessary medication as well as a black market of the drugs and a rationing of insulin by patients. Yet, none of this means that insulin or diabetic care should be outlawed, but that medicine should not be a for-profit industry. The same for trans-affirming healthcare. Hell, people like to point out the fact that trans people will share our hormones with each other in a black market of sorts and say, oh, this is proof that these drugs are bad, when in actuality it's just because many trans people are unable to afford these drugs or need to ration them because they are consistently not available to us. This person is saying they're going to send out prescription drugs to trans people, especially young people, youths, who might not be able to access it, whose parents don't want them to access, who cannot afford it. They're sending out unprescribed medicine to children. That is incredibly illegal. This disgusting, creepy bullshit is allowed to occur. So basically, this argument just boils down to anti-trans folks doing the meme, oh, you participate in capitalism? Why do you hate capitalism so much? Just in weird reverse. It really is fucked up how people will prey on capitalist anxieties in order to then use capitalism to attack minorities. Welcome to neoliberal policies, which makes itself seem progressive, but it's actually just repackaged capitalism. Get this discussion of a profit motive behind the medical industry providing transgender healthcare and surgeries is then quickly shifted to Jennifer Bilek in the film, a known gender critical feminist, who often writes about the supposed powerful billionaires behind the sinister LGBTQ movement trying to convert your daughters, which she gleefully does in Gender Transformations. And so what I found was a whole lot of very, very powerful um, moneyed people in the highest echelons of finance, pharma, and technology. Here, Bilek states that everyone from the banks to government, including President Joe Biden, are influenced by the secret agenda. And then she begins to name names. One of the first people I found was Jennifer Pritzker, part of the wealthiest families in America, the Pritzker family, who were massively invested in the techno-medical complex. The most probably important LGBT organization was Arcus Foundation. They were driving this gender identity ideology through all of our institutions with their money. And they created this whole political apparatus through these organizations by um, selling people basically on this being a human right as part of the LGB. Uh, what a surprise, it's all Jewish billionaires that she names, such as Jennifer Pritzker, a Jewish transgender woman in the medical industry that by like constantly misgenders present himself as a woman and he felt like a woman as if my a man god could know what a woman feels like not um, convincingly and... <laughs> this is where we need to take a sidetrack into bilek's other work to really get into why she is naming these specific billionaires in her other writing bilek will often name many other billionaires besides the ones that are mentioned in gender transformations as the secret funders of the transgender agenda naming people such as jewish holocaust survivor george soros or martine roseblath Knowing that this looks really bad for her, Jennifer Bilek will attempt to claim that it's just a seeming coincidence that she's only focusing on Jewish people when she names billionaires that fund the transgender agenda. I've often wondered why so many of the men involved in the transgender, transhumanist agenda are Jewish. And of course, I've been accused more than once of promoting a Jewish conspiracy theory. I just report on who the men are. I don't single them out for being Jewish, and I've never really speculated about why so many are. Quite some time ago, I came across Keith Wood's video on his theory of why this might be. I revisited this today because someone wrote and asked about the Jewish aspect of the men involved in this agenda, and I found it equally as fascinating as I did the first time. I wonder how others might feel about this. But as the wonderful YouTuber Sean pointed out in his recent video, Bilek likes to claim that she's just asking questions and not at all pointing out these billionaires' Jewishness, but at the same time, she will also link to known anti-Semitic far-right nationalists like Keith Woods in her work, directing her audience to learn more about these billionaires directly from an anti-Semite. Keith Woods is known to post anti-Semitic, racist, and anti-transgender memes, repeatedly targeting Jews and calling Jews parasites in his work, complaining about the Jew-run media. This pipeline that Bialik directs her audience directly down reveals her goal of naming a few billionaires who just 
happen to be Jewish. She's leaving the implication in the air without directly stating it, but then directs her followers to a more direct pipeline of anti-Semitic hate that they can fall down to further funnel them down the path. So by gender transformations propping up Bilek in their work, they're doing the same thing, just adding another step by directing them to Bilek, who will then direct people to Keith Woods. And she even directly mentions Jewish billionaires in this documentary. Here though, she never even mentions Judaism directly, just the billionaires, sanding off her more far right edges further to appear neutral. You see this hinting at anti-Semitic conspiracy theories often in anti-trans spaces. Take noted anti-trans campaigner Kelly J. Keen Minchel, who brought up in an interview the nebulous billionaire supposedly funding the trans movement, but when pressed to explain her dog whistle, she refused to elaborate, seemingly self-aware that she doesn't have actual proof to back up her claim, but just wanted to signal her anti-Semitic beliefs. Do you not know about the billionaires who are the billionaire men who are pushing this ideology and funding it? Are you not aware of those people? No, tell me Are more. Are you saying that that doesn't happen? No, tell me more. You just need to... No, women across New Zealand, we are they are very, very aware that there are men in women's spaces, men in women's sports, and they are giving carte blanche access to, unfettered access to women's spaces as soon as you say that those men are part of uh, the transgender ideology. As soon as you, as soon as a man basically puts on a dress, he is given unfettered access to women's spaces, uh, including prisons, including uh, rape crisis centres. And uh, I just think it's absolutely preposterous if you don't think women across New Zealand are afraid of that. Could you, you please just tell me a little more about the billionaires funding the transgender lobby? Well, yes, you've got Big Pharma, for example. They make a substantial amount of money out of transgenderism. I want to know why it's not important to a journalist to address the fact that there are men in women's spaces. It's really important why as a journalist for me to know more about the billionaires funding the transgender lobby. And happy, since you raised it, journalist, and since you raised it, I'm interested to know further mm. details. What can okay. you tell me? Well, I would like to. I would like to know why, as a journalist, you are prepared to be distracted by that, as opposed well, to. <laughs> but you mentioned man, it. Say a man. I, I, I haven't finished, and I'm sure you don't think interrupting is appropriate <laughs> consistently when you've invited me on your show. No, so no, I go would for just it. Say you go women for across it. New Zealand. Women across. Yet this finally ties together the entire narrative of gender transformations that it has been selling, as this is all just Nazi and fascistic rhetoric. As I said earlier in this video, Nazi rhetoric viewed Jewish people as inhuman monsters who were intentionally trying to dilute an Aryan bloodline, with gay and trans people being one way in which Jewish men such as Magnus Hirschfeld were trying to prevent Aryans from being able to reproduce and had infiltrated the government and institutions and the medical system in order to do so in Weimar Germany. Gender transformations and a lot of anti-trans rhetoric today is doing the same exact argument, pointing at the wealthy billionaires funding the trans agenda who just happen to be Jewish and claiming that they're trying to ruin the reproductive health of your daughters so that they can destroy the Anglo-Saxon race, something that folks like Matt Walsh will blatantly talk about. This is how the left has generally framed it. To be a less white country, by their telling, is to be a manifestly better country. That's why they celebrate the decline of the white population. It's why they actively seek to facilitate that decline in terms of percentages by inviting unchecked immigration across the southern border. Um, it's why they're very concerned about making sure that white people have less institutional power. Or you can take the Buffalo shooter who on May 14th, 2022, murdered 10 people and injured three more in Buffalo, New York. He traveled directly to a predominantly black neighborhood in order to kill black victims, and he often spoke about a Jewish order using black people to enact a white genocide as part of a great replacement. The whole idea of white replacement is directly based on fascistic and Nazi rhetoric, and is dovetailing quite neatly with the narratives around anti-transness that we see throughout in films like Gender Transformations. Further, the Buffalo shooter argued and pointed out how he believed trans people were primarily white and thought Jews were trying to make them infertile or kill themselves. <laughs> yes, white goyim, give your children to me and I'll make them think they're girls. <laughs> Thus, they'll all either kill themselves or become genetic dead ends. Oy vey, goyim, it's just too easy. 
All of this is similar to blood libel stories that incite violence against Jewish people. Stories of Jewish people supposedly trying to steal children for rituals or replace them with inhuman monsters. Identical to the narratives of how trans affirming doctors and trans advocates are trying to replace, steal, or make infertile your children, specifically your daughters, who we're only going to talk about in terms of their loss of reproductive health. And this is not isolated to violent shooters, but a lot of far-right rhetoric. I think in general there's a, a tone to it that feels very similar to old blood libel shit. Like the stuff that's been around since the, the medieval times kind of thing. Where, yeah, they're just like worried about defacing good Christian bodies mm -hmm. and using blood and uh, just the... the like the way that Alex Jones talks about it, where he's just like, and then they're gonna harvest, they're, they're gonna harvest your organs, whatever. They're gonna harvest your your organs. Um, <laughs> harvest your organs. <laughs> but like that tone mm. um, is very similar to I think like ancient love libel shit. It mm. it feels very much like it's being repurposed now in like sort of the trans moral panic that they're doing because sometimes it's not even that it's jewish people it's that trans people are secretly controlling like yeah and it's it yeah it's just very similar to a lot of like anti-semitic conspiracy theories but also a lot of like very old blood libel stuff just being repurposed yeah and it's it's interesting because i remember we were talking um in person one time about like the the connections and one thing that you sort of brought up was just how it's kind of very similar to you know nazi shit but kind of the emphasis is reversed whereas nazis were very much like we we hate the jews the jews are inhuman monsters trying to you know control everybody and they're making people gay and trans destroy good aryan bloodlines whereas now like that 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 narrative still exists but the emphasis is more on trans people are coming out it's a social fad like the emphasis is there rather than on evil the ruining people. bloodline stuff and secretly whisper whisper jews doing stuff political agenda being worked out and kids are sort of a test subject because you may have very large organizations, but there's a small group of people who are controlling these organizations and they tend to be political. All of this goes to showcase how anti-trans hate and anti-Semitism are not isolated pillars of bigotry, but often come alongside each other and connected to each other right next to anti-black rhetoric and racistly targeted violence. This turns us back towards gender transformation's entire narrative and the emphasis on girls, quote unquote, loss of reproductive health and how this ties directly to the constant fears and anxieties expressed by anti-trans advocates of a white replacement. To them, the goal of trans-affirming care is a plan to destroy the white Anglo-Saxon race by trying to make your children infertile. And your goal as a parent or someone who's trying to push back against the transgender agenda should be constantly focused on protecting your children's fertility so that they can make more children and create the nuclear, often Catholic, family structure where women are only viewed as baby-making factories and men and women become functions of a state where they must constantly work for the larger project of nationalistic authoritarian control and have no life outside of those reproductive and labor abilities. And all this ties into gender transformations rhetoric of the transgender agenda trying to indoctrinate your children, turn them infertile, and steal them away from you. While the film and a lot of anti-trans rhetoric likes to sand off the edges of this rhetoric, you can clearly see the pipeline and anxieties that it is funneling all this towards, as Jennifer Bilek clearly showcases within gender transformations itself. Gender transformations and more mainstream anti-trans narratives stop short of going that far because they know that going that far would be too overt for a mainstream audience. The whole goal is to get people started on a top level of just hearing about these concerns and walk them all the way down through all of this to finally get to this point if they are able to follow it that far especially as it continues to isolate you from other avenues of understanding about transgender people gender transformations walks you right up to jennifer bilek's vaguely pointing at jewish billionaires and leaves you to do the research further if you wish or make the implications if you want to and all of this dovetails with everything that we've been talking about. The fear of non-Western American culture throughout the film, the themes of worrying about trans men's reproduction, and the fear of children being mind-controlled and manipulated and taken from parents. All of this is playing upon fears that funnel people right into anti-Semitic conspiracy theories and far-right violent rhetoric, tying into eugenics and Nazi propaganda. All of this is capped off in gender transformations when it turns the focus at the end of the film into its final emotional manipulation. We cut to Evan. 
terrified of his own body, and, upon entering a men's bathroom, fearing the men around him. He is seen as weak and a victim, as the detransitioners and Abigail at the same time talk over this about how trans people will never really be their gender identity, but deformed in human monsters, turned into it by the sinister transgender agenda. She told me, Mom, I realized that no matter what I do, I never gonna be like my brother. Ultimately, and big content warning here, we see Evan standing in front of a train, stepping in front of it, and dying by suicide. In reality, Andrew Martinez also died by suicide on September 4th, 2019, at the age of 19 years old. He had been in foster care for the previous few years and had been admitted to the hospital for a drug overdose several months earlier, hinting at a more significant drug problem. According to Abigail, his mother, in sources outside of gender transformations, Andrew was supposedly denied mental health treatment while in foster care, something that even LGBTQ supportive news outlets decided to report on. And this speaks to a real truth, that the foster care system in the United States ultimately does not do enough to support the LGBTQ children that are in its care. Despite propaganda that children are taken to being turned trans by a secret cabal that roots itself in the US government being influenced by Jewish billionaires, the real truth is that trans kids are too often left without support, even if they are taken from families who themselves aren't supporting them. To me, it is absolutely gross and vile that this documentary takes the story of Andrew's actual mistreatment that led to his death and manipulates it for systemic violence against people like Andrew himself. Further, this underscores the eugenics theming of the entire film. This is what gender transformation's final emotional appeal is, fulfilling that narrative of blood libel. That your children will be taken away from you and murdered by a conspiracy that is run by Jewish people and the United States government, while never directly stating that, and just preys upon fears while infantilizing Andrew, treating him as an object to be used while creating a narrative that vilifies the things that could have saved his life, and then using that narrative to incite further violence against those like Andrew and the systems and support that could have saved him. It is ghoulish and a desecration of Andrew's life and memory. This is where gender transformations ends, its final emotional appeal. It tells all the parents that it has been intentionally manipulating that their potential trans child has been the victim of schools, the government, the pharmaceutical industry, whisper the Jews, and queer people themselves. It tells them repeatedly that their gut knows best, that they, as a parent, know their real child no matter what their child says to them. And that proves that they are not happy. But they need to put that face that they are happy, they are good, their life is different. But inside, I could tell that it's not the truth. And it ends by telling them if they don't continually pressure their child to not be trans, then their child will end up dead, and they will suffer just like Abigail Martinez, as it dramatizes the moment where the fictional Abigail learns of her child's death in an in intensely traumatic scene. <laughs> Due to the circumstances, there's nothing that you can recognize. I'm so, so sorry. They are told that their child's words are not real, but just manipulations from some outside force. No matter how much their child tries desperately to tell them that they want to be seen as who they are, the parents are told that all they need to do is continually push their child to be who they want them to be rather than what they are trying to tell them they are. It's so angering, given the truth, that Andrew died for the same reason that so many trans kids die by suicide today, because they felt that no one saw the real them, because no one listened when they tried to express themselves, because everyone around them only saw who they wanted them to be, extensions of themselves and their own legacy. 
Abigail Martinez only saw the daughter that she wanted. The daughter she wanted to continue her family. So she never saw the son right before her and lost him. And the world lost him. The isolation is what's deadly. And, and I like every single time um, that I've been in like a really dark place, it's because I felt alone mm -hmm. because having like community around you, having people that care about you and, and tell you that and that support you is what makes difficult times survivable. Yeah. And in these, in these groups, you will constantly see parents say that like their children are, or narcissists or they're manipulating them that they are they are trying to use the emotional pleas as a form of like a manipulation of like emotional blackmail so like a child will be like i just want you to see me as i am i just want you to love me as like for who i'm telling you i am and they're like that's manipulation don't listen to it and it's, I think that's something that gets missed a lot is that it's not just that the child wants to be affirmed. It's that they love their parents and they want their parents to love them, not their idea of them, not what they decided that they were going to be before they were even born. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. And um, I think that's the most heartbreaking part is you see the way that these these parents will like quote these children and the quotes to me are like they're so like heartfelt they're so raw and it gets immediately dismissed as like a script that they're being told to read by like their anime discord or something yeah, or ridiculous the yeah. yeah exactly yeah. yeah what's even more disgusting is that gender transformations final moments depict the trans community fighting against these narratives as uncaring bullies. We have what we call trans radical activists who will come and interrupt us. We don't hate them. We have sympathy for them. And we look upon them as maybe our own kids. In reality though, it's the trans community who has been desperately trying to have these kids be heard and seen so something like what happened to Andrew doesn't happen again. It's even more disgusting that the film's final frame is a picture of a pre-transition Andrew with Abigail. It's a complete and utter desecration of who Andrew was by trying to hold up a memory of who someone else wanted him to be and what led to his death. But that is what gender transformations does. It endlessly lies to create an incitement to violence, systemic and individual, public and private, against trans people. To tell parents to do this to children and to tell our culture at large that this is what needs to be done to trans people as a whole. But this is not unique to gender transformations. This is what all anti-trans narratives today are doing. Gender transformations is just a condensed two-hour version of the entire rhetorical pipeline that anti-trans rhetoric has been generating for the past few years. All the news articles, headlines, politicians' speeches, and social media continually vilifying trans people has been condensed here into a two-hour time frame. It may not be overtly mean-spirited and cruel in the way Matt Walsh's What is a Woman is, but in that way, it's much more insidious. Narratives like this are meant to generate fear, disgust, and ultimately hatred and violence towards trans existence in people who don't know any better about trans people in the first place. And it all leads to the same ends as those like Matt Walsh's What is a Woman, leading to the intentional genocide we are seeing being enacted against trans people today through legislations, incitements to violence, and more. Whether it happens in the halls of a government building, or to a young trans girl trying to just live her life in the United Kingdom, murdered by her friends, like what happened to Brianna Jai, 
or it's the endless denial of being seen as themselves that happened to kids like Andrew Martinez. It's all violence, nonetheless, stemming from the same exact narratives that works like gender transformations are generating. But this all leads to the larger question. What is all this in service of? Because certainly a trans genocide is not the ends. It is just the means towards something larger. And there have been hints of something larger going on, larger narratives that gender transformations wants to push a viewer's fear into. Why hint towards anti-Semitic conspiracy theories or concerns over the loss of reproductive health of trans kids, specifically white trans men, if there wasn't something bigger going on here? So, again, I ask the question, what are narratives like this in service of? That is the question that I want to examine next, because in my next video, I want to show you that anti-trans narratives are not just an isolated pillar of an issue that we need to fight, but an essential tenet to the growing fascism that has been continually on the rise over the past few years in the United States and around the world. In my next video, I want to look at the apparatus behind gender transformations, specifically the Epic Times. Not only is the Epic Times a right-wing newspaper that has slowly grown into one of the largest news media organizations and donors to right-wing groups, but it's also a cult that harbors much darker beliefs. And not just about aliens. Because what it does believe in is much scarier. And what's even scarier? This is most likely coming to a town near you very soon. And I don't just say that in a nebulous, like, oh, these narratives may affect your town soon. No, I literally mean you may have received flyers for it like I did on my front door or seen a billboard or poster in your neighborhood. But even beyond that, I want to show you in my next video how narratives like this are embedded in our everyday lives. All right, everybody, sorry to end on such a big cliffhanger, but as I said, I have so much more to discuss that's coming in a following video in the next few weeks. That video was actually going to be a part of this video, but it got so long that I needed to split it into two because boy, does it get wild, y'all. It really does. So for next video, we'll be examining the Epic Times specifically, but then using that to broaden out to a much larger discussion on how anti-trans narratives interlocks with other fascistic narratives like anti-Semitism and much more. That being said, while that video won't be released for a few weeks on my main channel here on YouTube because I wanna give this video a few weeks to sort of get some churn in the algorithm, I already have the next part available over on my Patreon. So if you want to dive right into that discussion, it is available for you over there for as low as $1 a month. And earnestly, I will say thank you to all my patrons because making videos like this one are not exactly great for my mental health, but they're also the ones that do the best in the algorithm. So my patron support is what enables me to not have to always focus on making algorithm friendly videos and do things that I'm actually excited about doing and fill me with joy. So just earnestly thank you to each and every one of my patrons. So please, if any of the stuff that I work on is meaningful to you or you really enjoy it and you want to see more of it, uh, most especially the the more joyous stuff that I have on this channel. Um, it really would mean a lot to me if you can go and support me over on Patreon. And I will say you get yourself added videos because I have a bunch of like exclusive videos over there as well. And speaking of trans joy, as I mentioned earlier in the video, if you do want to support me elsewhere, consider signing up for Nebula, the streaming service that is funding my film Identities. I am so pumped to get that out to you in just a few short months. Believe me, we have some fun surprises in store for you. But totally okay if you are unable to do that. I just really appreciate you watching this video, sharing it if you can, and I hope that you all, my friends, live long and prosper. I thanked my patrons last night, pre-flight, zero hour, 9 a.m., and they make me as high as a kite by then. I thank them so much. I thank them as a wife. Love you. Thank you for supporting me. I adore you all. Here's your wonderful names.
Joe Herman Hold, Carrie Ellen Foss, Niels Osborne, Odenholm, Arklesser, Barbie Ann Rounds, Sarah Montgomery, Jack McCallan, Stephen Kleinard, Hannah Friedrich, Christian Hurst, Jazz Miss, Randy Thompson, Samuel Howard, Quite Bearish, Marshall Nye, Rose Conley, Elton Tivy, Courtney Ray Kelly, Dark Archon, Auntie Kate 808, Tara Rose, Lily Blainley, Vincent Ellington, Amada Kaiba, Miranda Keitel, Zane Schusler, Michael Woolnitz, Matt Chung, Alex Miller, Nia Samir, Super Desi, Spooky Heather, Sylvia, Todd Verling, Meadow Whisperer, Joseph Dewey, Semi Joe Retro, Jem Shin, Iron, Chris Showers, Lily Gray, Angela Hendricks, Joelle Gilry, Luna, James Krivda, Shep Alderson, Dominic Noble, Weirdy Beardy, Kaylee Lang, Sonia Nero Perdo, Nathan Froughton, Farangato, Quattro, Ryan Hunter, Frida George Holstrom, W. Randy Edie, Sean Sullivan, Kevin Freitag, Sergeant Bradshaw, Epsilon is greater than Fly and Kata, Bob Saget, Verdux Kai, Troy Stull, Blue. Craig and David, Teague Wilson, Scott Russell, Stephen Richardson, John Weatherby, Britz Krieg, Carry On, Casual Observer, Kay Liss, Patricia Cromptick, Jess Johnson, Kurt Mullen, Prince of Void, Sarah Lemero, Jason Knott, Teresa Bailey, Joe and the Wretch Witch, Hope, Jason Tuliana, Ruben Gines, Shield Maiden 4444, Elizabeth Tristenson, The Mighty Ginger Joe, Beatrix Purvis, Matthew Craiglow, Roy Negby, Grumpy Dragon 75, Emma Ramirez, Melody Ann Winters Good, Sasha M, Damian Rice, Valerie Blackbird, Melinda Walters, Kylara Aurora, Sean Piper, Mark H. Williams Author, Jade Persuades, Mark H. Williams author adam smatcher jades persuades david demma tyler edwards sarah leslie hutchkins blueberry hill sarah bystam Teresa, Doherty Lucero, Laura Demero, Penal Sparing Vaginoplasty, Celestial Dawn, DM Collins, Tori Perez, Caroline Clark, Crit Max, Lev Goodwin, Nye Fan, Callum McLeod of Clan McLeod, Michael Weber, Lou Toussaint, Henry Pierce, Tom G311, Julie Werner, and Chai Cat Midnight Sky. Mwah. Love you all, adore you all. Sorry I couldn't do it all as William Shatner, but timing and everything, but adore you and thank you, patrons, for making all of this possible. I love you so much.